That's it. Okay, so we can let's do it now. So we set set off set ourselves off in the right direction with his motivation, setting our motivation, re, reminding us of our reliance on the Buddha, and stating our motivation. And I think we need to talk because this is a Vajrayana teaching, Tara's Vajrayana practice. We have to understand some really fundamentally necessary things, which means we have to especially understand the bodhicitta, and we have to understand the motivation for doing things. So that's what we're going to we should talk about. These are very much. These are really an emphasized. I mean, all this, all the three principles of the path are important: renunciation, bodhicitta, emptiness. And we're going to be discussing all of these all the way through. <clears throat> so motivation is very much a part of the um, Mahayana component. Okay, so we're here to listen to these teachings, to think about it, to do some practice, to try and understand the benefit, psychologically, the benefit of this kind of practice, how it helps us develop our marvelous potential, <clears throat> so we can be a benefit to others. Sange charang soke chognam la jancho badu dagmi kyapsu chi dagi chon yen gi sonam ki drola penjir sange drupa shog Sange charang soke chognam la jancho badu dagmi kyapsu chi dagi chon yen gi sonam ki drola penjir sange drupa shog Sange charang soke chognam la jancho badu dagni kyapsu chi Dagi chun yen gi sonam ki Jola penche sangi drupa shog So basically yesterday we just went through the, the try to put this practice in the framework of this bigger picture this you know the, the lamrim the all in other words all the stages of our path on the way to accomplishing our own Buddhahood the stages of the path stages you know, like grades, the gradual path. And this is, you know, I can't stress this enough is how important it is to understand where all the Buddhist teachings fit. And when I first studied, studied the Lamrim, I heard that concept. I heard the concept. I even heard if you pick up a book and you just look at any teaching, you'll know where it fits. It didn't make sense to me. I couldn't comprehend. Because I think, whereas, whereas if I mentioned yesterday, if we talk about maths or music, we understand what it means. We know it's a gradual progress. We know that you've got to learn simple things first and then more advanced. And you know, oh, wow, that's too difficult for me. I can't handle that. But we do not think that when it comes to spiritual teachings. But we have to understand it. You know, and that means we have, what we have to understand is our own mind our own psychology, our, where we are at in our own mind. And then when we hear the instructions, we have to hear what level of instructions they are. So, you know, one of the things, you know, so one of the, th we, we just, so we discussed that mainly yesterday and where Tara fits into this. So Tara is part of Vajrayana. Vajrayana is postgraduate. So the meditation we did yesterday, five minutes, 10 minutes at the end, was actually very simple. It didn't, you see, this is the point. It didn't seem complicated. When you read Lama Yeshi's book, Introduction to Tantra, it sounds simple because he presents it simply. The meditation we did, we presented it simply, but it doesn't mean it's not, an, it's not coming from an advanced practice. So that's where we get confused because, you know, if you're listening to physics, there's no way you can present it simply if you haven't done basic math. So we think, well, it sounds simple. Why is that more complicated? It's a really interesting point, you know. Well, and, we, and for example, we, the commonest thing we all think is that compassion is, is the point of the path. Compassion, bodhicitta, we're being moved by that, you know, having compassion. And it's true, it is more advanced, it, it is. But as His Holiness says, compassion is not enough. You can't just leap into compassion. This sounds very peculiar to us. We don't really understand what that means, you know. But I have incredible compassion for animals. I cry when I see suffering. What do you mean it's, it's advanced? What do you mean, I, you know, but we, we don't understand the levels of compassion that Buddha's talking about. And they are not possible to have until we understand the earlier stages, which is renunciation, which for me is like compassion for yourself first. So we, it's hard for us to hear this. It really is. But when we start to really study it and really practice, then we begin to see. Then we understand, you know. 
So the other aspect I think is very hu is huge that is often very confusing for us modern people when we think about Buddhism. We all know that Buddha is not a creator. We know that. We, we mightn't have studied Buddhism, but we know he doesn't talk about God, meaning a creator. He doesn't use that concept. He says we don't need creating. His view is that our consciousness is beginningless and is not physical and is not the handiwork of mummy or daddy or a creator. So it's a, it's a massively different view. It's powerful. So when we hear this, oh, well, there's no creator, and then we hear, you know, Let's say if you listen to Tibetans or you observe Tibetans, they are unbelievably devoted. They have incredible faith, incredible devotion, and then they have incredible numbers of prayers, you know. You can sit in pujas and prayers all day if you go to the monasteries. If you're with Lama Zobarimsha, you could go all day doing prayers and pujas, you know. And we think, well, this is really confusing. If you don't believe in a creator, who are you praying to? Because necessarily the view of a prayer in the world, we, 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 we don't talk about a prayer if you're a, if you're a mat philosophical materialist. Of course you don't. Because you don't, quote unquote, believe in, a, in God, believe in the creator. So that's very confusing to us. But that plays a major role. So let's talk about that. And that's where we're in this, you know, um, in the course notes that I prepared for you, one of the chapters is we, we need a teacher, especially at this level of practice. And if you hear Lama Zobar Rinpoche teaching, if you hear the, the traditional Vajrayana teachings, an absolute prerequisite is, is a teacher. In fact, it's a central component of the practice in order to really do these kinds of practices properly. So that confuses us as well. So what is devotion then, and why is it important? Well, I mean, you know, I can talk about it in a very simple way. You can talk about it in a simple way, and I think it's important to do that and to try to make it logical. It's got to seem reasonable. It's got to seem psychologically sound, you know, just to hear it and say you've got to have faith, but on no basis. You just, it's just utter confusion. So let's even, look, let's even look at the word faith, you know. What's it mean? And again, that's something, the commonest thing we feel, because we assume that religion can't be proved. We assume that, I mean, you know, if you think about the world, it's just basically all over the world since the, top, since the beginning of humans, we've come, humans have been coming up with ideas, thoughts, opinions, viewpoints about how the world exists. You've got countless numbers of viewpoints and they all, for me, I think it's important to give them all equal status insofar as they are opinions about reality. You might not like some, you might not agree with some, that doesn't, that's not the point here. So you've got, you know, just among, so you've got religious philosophical views, haven't we? And I think that they are views. The viewpoint is philosophical. We think there's religion and then we think there's philosophy. No, religion is philosophy. It's views about how things exist, isn't it? You've got all the, sec the secular views, which are very, uh, predominate a lot now. They're not, not, it's not as if we've come up with materialism. I mean, in, the, in, in the, all the amazing Indian literature, um, <clears throat> you know, there are all very many viewpoints, and, and, and including materialists. They're all in there in the literature from thousands of years ago, you know, before the Buddha even. So you've got views that posit a creator, philosophical views. They're called, and they're the majority of the religions we think of in this day and age, isn't it? Like Christianity, all the Abrahamic religions, you know, that's all coming out of the Middle East. The Jews, the Muslims, and the Christians, all coming from the Middle East, you know, it's very interesting. They all fight with each other. It's kind of interesting. It's like family fighting. And they all posit the idea of a creator. So we have to understand what that means. And then we have to understand where Buddha's coming from. Not just go, oh yeah, Buddha doesn't talk about a creator. We have to know what it means. What, what's his logic? What does it mean, you know? But he does posit the concept of a Buddha. So this is very interesting. I mentioned this quite a few times. But I know one time, in, I, I was a Catholic, right? And I remember um, I was invited by the Catholic University in Melbourne where they had a conference a couple of years ago, or 10 years ago now, I think. Yeah, to, give a, to, get, to, to be one of the speakers at this particular conference, you know? So I had a 20-minute slot. And I, and I didn't know what I was going to talk about. I kept putting it off to decide. And even the morning I arrived, I had no idea what I was going to talk about. So I thought I'd look up the definition of God. So I looked up the Merriam-Webster Dictionary and came up with the definition of God. So there were three essential qualities. Infinite wisdom, which is called omniscience. You know, we always love to use Greek words for our fancy things. So omniscience, all-knowing, all knowing all. Infinite compassion. Infinite power. Again, fancy Greek word, omnipotence. These are the three essential qualities of a creator. Well, I thought, that's interesting. They're the three essential qualities of a Buddha. 
So straight away, we can hear that, and it, and it seems to me, well, over the centuries, humans have come up with similar observations, different interpretations, and that's the difference. Different interpretations, radically different interpretations of what and how and where and the causes of it and blah, 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 you know? <clears throat> so the Christian view is there's only one of those. It's called God. He's a creator, usually referred to as he, isn't it? We know that. Um, not physical, pervades the universe, knows everything, and has no cause. I think there's a whole deep discussion in the Christian theology, and I think probably the others is too, about, a, I forget the term, how can there be a cause, a causeless caused? A causeless cause, something like that. Well, the Buddha, this is exactly what he argues about, extensively in all his literature, extensively discussing that that's not a possibility, which of course is a total insult to Christians. I think this sounds like just utter heresy to talk this way. You can't argue with that. You can't question that. So for the Buddha, the idea that there can be something that doesn't have a cause, an energy that is a mind, that knows everything, he agrees with knowing everything, he agrees with infinite compassion, and he agrees that there can be an energy that has infinite power, that's called a Buddha, and guess what, he says, every single consciousness, every single person has the potential to become one of those. Now that's really insulting for a Christian, that everybody can become God, you would never say that. You would never say that. You can become oneness with God, you can go to heaven and be with God. You can be God-like, but to say you can become God, this is beyond shocking. So this is a massive difference. And the difference is in the philosophical presentation of how these things exist. That's the stuff that we have to study, you know. So anyway, my talk was the similarities between the definition of, of God and Buddha. I don't know if the Catholics liked it, but that's what I talked about. So that's Buddha's view. So then clearly the beings who are called, you know, the Buddhists have observed that. That's their observation. It hasn't come from on high. So the Christian one, we know because you can't prove it, because how can you, if you can prove that God is right, that means you're God. That's really logical. So you can never prove that God is right. So what do you do? You have faith in God. You have faith. You have confidence. But look at the word faith. Confide, with trust, confident. Now, that also exists in Buddhism, but we assume that it's blind faith, which means you can't prove it. That's the deepest assumption among modern people who've been, like us who've been brought up with materialist philosoph philosophical materialism. You can't prove it. The distinction between scientific knowledge and religious knowledge, according to the scientists, is you can prove science. Well, Buddha says, hey, sorry, I'm in that group. I'm in the group that you can prove. That's impossible for us. We think that's a demented idea. So if you can prove it, then we think, well, why do you have faith? We've got to look at the evolution of our knowledge. Look at it. When you've never learned mathematics in your whole life and somebody, you go to school and your teacher tells you that one plus one is two, you've never heard of that in your entire life. Oh, mummy, I just learned today that one plus one is two. I've got no idea what she's talking about. I've never heard of this. Okay, so you have to have faith in her first. You've got to, for you to sit down and do your homework and prove it, you've got to have some confidence. I mean, if she's some kind of peanut and just made up something, you've got, you've got, to, you know, you've got, to, you've got to have a background. So this is why, in the Buddha's view, whether, whether it comes to Buddha or a person who's called a teacher, you've got to use your noggin. You've got to do your market research. You've got to do your, you've got to do your, your due diligence. You've got to start to check because you're going to spend a lot of time going on this path to enlightenment. Forget about just discovering one plus one is two. You, you don't want to waste your life and waste your time and just believe some idiot who tells you something. And that's the biggest mistake we have in Buddhism, um, in the modern world about um, uh, religious philosophy. You just leap in. So people go to Buddhist teachings, oh, wow, this person was so charismatic, he's so amazing, he must be a Buddha, you know. It's meaningless, utter rubbish. You can't say that. It's because you feel good. There's no logic to prove he's, he's a Buddha. Hitler made people really feel good. And look where they, he led them, up a garden path. So the first of all, those different views. The crucial one here is the Buddha, the Buddhist view, the Mahayana view. And this is not the same as the Hinayana view. There are different views in Buddhism. You go to Thailand and Burma, you will not hear you about becoming a Buddha. They obviously assert the existence of a Buddha and that some people have the karma to become a Buddha, but most have the have the, you know have the ability to, to achieve enlightenment. Like I said yesterday, you graduated high school. First, second scopes, the wisdom wing. You graduate there and you achieve your own liberation from suffering. And then the, but the other radical difference, the radical difference is presented in the teachings in the world, Buddhist teachings, and you can see it's different interpretations of Buddhist teachings, is that when you've achieved your own enlightenment, achieved your own nirvana, your own cessation of suffering, when you die in that life, you're finished. 
There's not an atom of you left. There's not an atom of your mind left. You, not just your negative karma ceases, not just that you've achieved liberation from, and, you, and, and then, you know, <clears throat> but that even your mind ceases. Well, as His Holiness the Dalai Lama said and smiled, sort of laughed and said, we Mahayanas have a problem with that. Because the Mahayana view asserts that consciousness can never end. So that's a radical difference in the Buddhist teachings, isn't it? It's huge, that difference. Because that's the Mahayana view. That your consciousness is beginningless and it is endless. So this is something that absolutely is like the biggest shock in the whole world. Whether you're a Christian or a materialist, this is a big shock. It's like it seems the most demented thing we've ever heard. So but it's something fundamental if you want to understand Buddhist teachings, even theoretically. You've got to posit this possibility. Because if you're not created at the time of conception by your mother or father or God... You've got to ask the question, well, where do I come from? It's very logical. What's the evolution of me? Where could I track me back to? If you're a Christian, you track yourself back to God and you track yourself back to mummy and daddy because they did, you know, they did join in with God and they provided the body, but God puts the soul there. But if you're merely a materialist, you, got, you can only track yourself back to mummy and daddy. Everything that you are is coming back to mother and father. And that's a huge philosophy. That's something we just, but we just take that for granted as a truth, don't we? We just assume that's how it is. We, who questions? Who studies science to that degree? None of us, you know. Most of us might not. I haven't, certainly. Just believe it. We just believe it. Or we say, oh, it's been proved. Well, no, it has been proved, yes, that your body comes from your mother and father. There's no argument. That can be proved. But yet mind, your feelings, your emotions, your tendencies, your love, your compassion, your hate, your whatever you want to call it, that for the Buddha absolutely has got nothing to do it doesn't no sorry it has got plenty to do with your parents because they're a catalyst for it and they can share those same qualities but they do not give you anger and love and being good at music and being good at football i can't describe the difference this is a massively powerful philosophical view and the implication of it is fundamentally necessary to understand this is huge for the buddhist practice because the implication of it is you you, you are your own boss because the Buddha's view is you don't start from God, you don't start from a career, from your mummy and daddy, and you certainly can't start from nothing. You've got to track yourself back to something, because that's what cause and effect means. We know that. Everything we know about about cause and effect, and as far as the Buddha's concerned, it's the law that runs the universe. He calls it the law of karma. You know yourself, everything you can point to right now, everything, every miniature tiny thing, at every moment in your mind, because it's a phenomenon that does exist, you've got to track it back to what's its evolution? What's the evolution of it? It's a lovely term, evolution. What is the evolution of it? Well, everything you've got to track it back to, you know, you think of it in a linear, literal, second by second linear sense. You know, the lamp, I sit on my desk here, but it's illuminating my face a little bit. You know, you, it's got many, many parts, and each of those parts track back to a previous moment of those parts, and a previous, and a previous. And at some point, when you got it at IKEA, there was in you know, all these separate parts, all these separate bits. It was the cord, the bit, the metal, the switch, the that, the lamp, the the hood, the the light bulb, all these bits, and all each of those had a previous continuity of things. And you keep tracking back. It's very precise. You could do that accurately if you were really good. Now the mind is the same for the Buddha. So he's positing our mind is not the, is not physical. He doesn't call it a soul. He doesn't posit another component like that, or spirit. He says we have mind. So this is why if you don't understand the Buddha's view of what the mind is, even just roughly, you don't understand Buddha. It just sounds peculiar. We know perfectly well the brain doesn't go anywhere. It turns into yuck in the ground once it's dead. So which bit of you comes from before and which bit of you will continue? Not a soul, Buddha doesn't posit that because that's a, a philosophical view that, that posits something that comes from a creator that is also like a creator, is not caused, is permanent, is unchanging. There's different characteristics the way it's presented and this is one of Buddha's key, dis, key arguments with those different positions that the Hindus, the various Hindus before him held from which he diverged because he brought up in that tradition, went as far as he could go. And, he, and, he, and he, diff he diverged in his own direction in relation to many of those views. One of them about the very ontological status itself of what the self is. You know, that's where he diverged. As His Holiness says, it was these amazing Indians more than 3,000 years ago who were the ones who began the investigation into the nature of self. 
So these are the ones we have to really think about. We, I mean, some of us might have had a background in yoga, a background in the Hindu teachings, and might have studied them. Amazing. I mean, I haven't studied them. I haven't studied much of Buddhism. I've done a few little bits or Christianity or whatever. But the differences for Buddha is that they're different in his presentation. The difference is in the very actual ontological status of the self or the, whatever a person is, what a person is, and indeed what everything is and how in its very bones these things exist. This is where he diverged in his own direction. You know, These are the differences that Buddha has. Many similarities. He didn't throw out all the things he'd internalised from the amazing Indians. I mean, these are brilliant genius philosophers, psychologists, you know, all the spiritual practitioners. He didn't throw out. He took so much with him because he found that he had found that to be true. The view of karma comes from his Indians, you know. He found that he has found that to be true. He's got his own interpretations for sure. He diverged in particular in relation to the very nature of the self, what it is. And that is the, that's the teaching we all know, the ultimate teachings on, on what we call emptiness. And all of this, all of this is, you know, all of these teachings, as I'm saying in this Lam Rim, are all presented in a, in a, in a, logical, in a logical order according to the, the level of difficulty in understanding it and practicing it. So the Mahayana path, like I've been saying last night, is presented. <clears throat> you know, the, the first, the, you, you, in the first scope of practice, the, the philosophy you learn is is, va is the beginnings of, the, of this vast body of knowledge about the law of cause and effect, the law of cause and effect. And the, this is the fundamental point in the first first stages of Buddhist practice. So when you, you know, I know when Lama Yeshi, Lama Zopa started teaching Westerners in the early 70s in Kopan Monastery, the very first point when he started, started practicing, started teaching the Lam Rim, the very first point he would always discuss, which is crucial for us philosophical materialists, is what the mind is and how in its nature it's beginningless. I mean, this is the most shocking idea for us. If we're a Christian, if you want to say something is beginningless, God is beginningless and it's a whole equality. It's something special. Meaning, me, and we think beginningless means no cause. No, it doesn't mean that. Not for the Buddha. Everything that exists, everything in the universe, in the universe we know of, in terms of being mind or objects of, you know, or the, or the physical world itself, they're necessarily in the nature of being impermanent. And everything that's impermanent is 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 a product of the law of cause and effect. They utterly come together, you know. So it's huge to even begin to think about how this consciousness, the very first stages of our practice. It's not the product of a creator. I was talking, I was going to start talking about faith, but I'll come back to it. I was beginning to talk about faith. I'm sorry, I wandered off. And it's a crucial one. So, you know, the mind that is beginning is not physical, is not called a soul, there's no third component, body and mind. That's it for the Buddha. But mind has got this much more subtle levels of cognition. Mind is not the handiwork of anybody else. It comes from its own self. So like I said, if you track back the lamp, if you track back this lamp, if you have such a brilliant mind, and you could track back the components of the lamp, you would keep going and you'd end up at the first moment of this universe. Think about that. Think about the logic of that. At, never, at any given point, when you've tracked back even the first hundred years of the pits that came from this, which came from that, which came from this, which came from that, you'll keep going. But we have this deep instinctive belief in, well, you're going to track back it to the first moment. There has to be a first moment. We, ha we desperately want a first moment. Well, this view for Buddha is, 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 a, is, is, is a misconception. Having the view itself, even asking the question, where's the beginning of it? When, what's, when did it begin? Even the universe itself. You know, it's a misconception, it's a wrong question. And that wrong question comes from a wrong assumption, which is rooted in ego grasping, is rooted in the misconception that believes in the intrinsic thing and intrinsic me and intrinsic everything else, which is why the view of God, the concept of God being beginningless and the concept of God not being created is not a possibility for the Buddha. It's not a possibility. It's not a possibility. It's impossible. That sounds shocking to a Christian, but it's not a possibility. It's not viable. So one has to study that seriously, not just believe it, but we can at least state it here, you know. So for the Buddha, an ordinary, per like I said, an ordinary person like you and me can become a Buddha, whereas you would never, like I said, you never say that about a person who's a Christian or a Hindu. You don't become God. So the mind is beginningless, the very first point that Lama Zobar would talk about. And so the implication of that, of course, is it's yours. You do not track it back to mummy and daddy and you don't track it back to a creator. You track it back to previous moments of your own mind. So it's your mind. That's it. That's pretty powerful already, experientially. Pretty intense. 
So back to the Buddha one, the concept of a Buddha and faith. So I think it's a very, it's a huge, it plays a massive role and we need to comprehend it, you know. So like I said, when you go to school and learn one plus one is two, you need to have faith in your teacher. Of course you do. But what's that? I mean, okay, you haven't made the choice. Your mother sent you there. We just assume that your mother's checked up that that teacher's a reasonable teacher. And it often might not be true. But we can see this, the principle of it, you know. So the same with certainly when it comes to anything, and learning anything. If you think of this is, this is the necessity for a teacher, now I want to talk about the necessity for a teacher and what a teacher is and what role faith plays. And this is especially powerful in the Vajrayana. That's the point I want to discuss here. So why do we need a teacher and what is a teacher? Well, you know, if you're living in India at the time of, Mr. of Shakyamuni Buddha, of this Prince Siddhartha, this person who was a prince, left his home, went off and joined all the amazing other yogis and went through the whole stages of, of, of practice and study as far as he could go, and then he continued and continued, and, he, and, he, and in his own mind he went further, and he achieved what we refer to as Buddhahood. He became a Buddha. Bud, which implies the eradication of the delusions from the mind. Da implies the development to perfection of all the virtues in the mind. He became one of those. <coughs> so if you were at the time of the Buddha, you know, we see statues now. Like, look at my statue behind me, my nice Thai statue of the Buddha. We go, oh, yeah, that's a Buddha. We straight away go, oh, yeah, there's Buddha, you know. So back at the time <coughs> in India, if you were living, living then, you would never have recognised a Buddha. You wouldn't have known. We say, oh, that's the Buddha. Like, there's only been a Buddha two and a half thousand years ago. That we would have somehow known. But if you'd been back then at that time, believe me, you would not recognise the Buddha. You'd see this nice fellow looking like hundreds of sadhus. I mean, India was crawling with sadhus, these fellows with their yellow robe on, running around teaching. That's what they did. Buddha would have looked like just like one of them. You could not tell one sadhu from another. You don't, you're not going to have magic eyes. Go, you wouldn't have seen a fellow with you know, a lump on his head and special shining light coming out of him, which is how we think of the Buddha. That's ridiculous. You would have seen a nice person. So, what would you, so what, who was Buddha? Who was Buddha? That was a form. That was a shape. That was a human being. Now, you couldn't, you don't, you'd just see a human being. So who was he? He was the teacher. He was the guru. He was, the gu he was your guru. You didn't say, oh, there's Buddha. You say, that's my guru, my teacher. So then that means we have to understand what the Buddha is. I think we mentioned this briefly last night. So what is Buddha? Buddha, this word refers, the abs they call it about the absolute Buddha. Just keep it simple, keep it simple. It's the, it's the actual Buddha, actual Buddha, actual Buddha, is the, is the consciousness, the unmanifest, all-pervasive, all-knowing, all-compassionate, all-powerful consciousness or mind that is all-pervasive, meaning if your mind is not physical and when your mind is unencumbered by all the junk, that your mind can't be confined by space or time or matter, finally, can it? So it pervades the universe. It is wherever there is existence. And I was a Catholic. I loved this idea because I was, very, I was in love with God, you know. God is everywhere. I think about it. God is everywhere, you know. I try to conceptualize God is everywhere. That's exactly what the Buddha is. Buddha mind is everywhere. It can't not be if it's not physical. And it's finally removed all the delusions. Right now, our mind is also not physical, but it's, it's, it's stuck in this bag of bones. Why? Because we're deluded. We have countless delusions in the mind due to intense habit over countless lifetimes, including especially attachment and ego grasping, that causes us to be locked inside this body and we can only access the tip of the tip of the tip of the iceberg of our mind, which is our conceptuality and our sensory consciousness. And we're addicted to that level. So we can't access 99.9% .9 of our mind because it's blocked by our delusions. So when the Buddha's removed all those obscurations, removed all the delusions, removed all the hindrances, that mind can only be pervading wherever there is existence, as much as you can conceptualize that. There can't be anywhere, if you can think of it this way, which is a very dualistic view, but that's the reality of our human mind. There can't not be the Buddha's mind. It's not possible. Thinking about that's pretty tasty, you know. It's logic for the Buddha, not a belief, it's logic, given the nature of mind, given the possibility of Buddhahood. So that's actual Buddha, the, um, the, 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 the absolute Buddha they refer to. But, but, but given that a person who's become a Buddha, oh no, the other point is this, as Lama Zopa says, Lama Yeshi too, it's a, it's a bit like Christianity, when you say, when there's only one God, well there's only one Buddha, there's only one of those Dharmakayas, you can't have more than one non-physical energy flying around bumping into each other, that's a dualistic concept. So this is very shocking to us to hear this. But there are billions of rupakayas, form bodies. 
So what's that mean? The Buddha, in order, the reason a person is a Buddha, what drove, what underpinned their wish, their, their, what their, their, their path to Buddhahood was compassion. Un, insane levels of unbelievable compassion. And this is why we have to understand compassion in order to really understand, I mean, the, the, the motivating, the drive that the motivates, the motivating drive of a person who's becoming a Buddha, you know, is unbelievable compassion. And so, of course, that's why we have to understand suffering in the Four Noble Truths, right back at the beginning, the, the, the Four Truths for the Noble Ones. We've got to understand what suffering is, because what is compassion? Compassion is empathy with someone suffering. But we only think of the first kind, when the bad things happen. And we usually only have compassion for a few innocent victims. That's about it. Our view of compassion is profoundly limited right now because we have a wrong, from the Buddhist point of view, we have a, mis, a misconception, a wrong analysis of suffering and its causes. And so we've got to study the Four Noble Truths first in the wisdom wing, which is the work you do for yourself, for yourself. And then you can begin to expand that to include other sentient beings when you realize we're all in the same boat. So the Buddha, a person becomes a Buddha, what drives them to become a Buddha is this insane levels of unbelievable compassion which then culminates as bodhicitta, this wish to never give up working for sentient beings. Becoming a Buddha so you can help sentient beings. So this compassion then, so then a Buddha having a mind that is not, having no aspect, no body, doesn't need a body, but they see that ordinary peanuts like you and me living in the samsara, living in the world of bodies and believing in our own karmic appearances and having our senses and going crazy and killing, you know, harming ourselves, they have to manifest at our level well, this is the same as the Christian teachings, isn't it? God made man. God became, God manifested as Jesus. Isn't it? Same idea. The Bodhisattva idea. That, you know, um, that, that this omniscient mind, out of infinite compassion, manifests in a body that you and I can communicate with. Well, there are two kinds. One is the one we see, one we see behind us. And if you would have been back then at the time of India, you would have seen this nice person. But you would have to have checked up on him because you wouldn't have known he's a Buddha. You can't. You see a human. It's not possible to know he's a Buddha. Not possible. How can you? Your mind isn't that level. You, th you might have thought he was a nice fellow, you, but you check up on him. That's what he says in the teachings. Don't believe what I tell you. Check it like you would gold. You know, do your market research. So he wasn't. He so he so he he would have looked like a human being. But his mind was the mind of a Buddha. But don't, you don't believe it. Just, just don't believe someone tells you, check up. Because what else can you do? You can't see that he's enlightened. You can't see that possibly. So the only thing you can do is use inferential certainty. Have conf confidence intellectually. There's this lovely process we go through, the way they talk about it in the teachings. We all are starting at the level of wrong view. So use any body of knowledge, even, forget Buddhism, but like science. I mean, like even acupuncture, anything. Or even the existence of Melbourne. There's a place called Melbourne. You've lived in this little town and they, you know, they've never heard of aeroplanes and never heard of flying anywhere, never heard of any other place. That's how we all are, our small minds. And you suddenly hear there's a place that will take you, you know, if you walk there six months or if you flew an, uh, if you're an aeroplane, it'll take you, you know, 24 hours to get there. And you say, don't be ridiculous. There's no such place as Melbourne. Don't, what are you talking about? That's wrong view. But you've got an open mind, so you keep, you keep checking. You keep checking, you start to listen to people. And other people mention Melbourne. Oh, you go, oh, that's interesting. And you gradually merge and you now you get to, towards doubt. Your mind starts to shake, but you've done some research and you now t go towards doubt, but still tending towards the wrong view. Well, maybe there's a place called Melbourne. They mention, he, no, 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 not possible. But you keep checking, you keep looking, you keep studying, you keep learning. Let's talk about acupuncture as a better example. So you keep thinking, well, you know, needles in people, that's absurd. You've never heard of such a ridiculous idea. But you start looking into it. And you hear, so you go towards doubt, tending towards the right view. You keep studying. You're becoming more confident. This is a natural internal process. You start to become more confident. Confident. Next one is a called right belief. You've done so much research now that you've got, you've got co such confidence. But you, you, you've got belief in it. But not just because you like it. That's what we think of as belief. We think belief is just, oh, what do you believe in? And you go around shopping, you know, for a little bit of things to believe in, putting your kit bag, I believe in this and I believe in that. It's complete superstition. It's just, it's just idiocy. It's ignorance. But that's what we think of religion. But you keep working, you keep studying, you keep checking, you keep looking, and you get more confident, and eventually you get inferential certainty. This is a profound level of knowledge. And I think this would mean that you could sit down and do an exam in acupuncture, and you could pass it. But you've not even put one needle in one person. That's a possibility. And why is that a possibility? This is something that's so important to understand. That if 
acupuncture, Buddhism, are valid body of knowledges, bodies of knowledge. If they're valid, if they're valid body of knowledge, now that's already a powerful point because we just think religion is something made up by somebody and it's just a random bunch of random ideas that you can pick and choose and believe in. I mean, anybody to even posit that possibility has to be idiotic, but that's how arrogant materialist philosoph philosophical materialists talk. Oh, you just believe in it, you've made up stuff, you know. I mean, yeah, humans make up stuff. Buddha agrees. We're living in la-la land, believing in things that don't exist. Yes, he agrees with us. But here, the Buddha's view is, no, here, what I'm saying is, if Buddhism, if acupuncture is a valid body of knowledge, this is a crucial point. It's got to be coherent first intellectually. That's why they study for 20, 25 years in the monasteries. And that's just the tip of the iceberg. And starting this vast body of knowledge, coming back, right back to the Indians, you know really internalizing it and using logic and analysis at the, at the most sophisticated level of our conceptual mind. Because if something is valid, you, can, you have to prove it has to be coherent theoretically. This is completely reasonable. Well, the Buddha, Buddhism is a worldview. It's a view, it's, it's, it's a view, what do they call it in science? A view, an, ex, an explanation of everything. Of course you have to believe that. You, you'd laugh if you heard that because we're still thinking that we clever scientists are trying to find one. Well, Buddha's got it already. He's been having it quietly for two and a half thousand years, telling us. It's up to us to prove it, though. So that this is the thing about the Buddha, then. This is the Buddha. So then they have to manifest in a body that you and I can communicate with. So kind Shakyamuni Buddha, this person Buddha, manifests in a human being at the time of India, looking like an Indian, looking like a sadhu. He was an Indian gentleman, he had a, an Indian mummy, an Indian daddy, an Indian body, in, spoke Indian words, nice brown skin. And he looked like a human. He looked like a human. That's it. You see a human. Oh, there's a human being. Oh, look at that. Because you can't see his mind. You can't see his non-physical omniscient mind pervading the universe. So how kind he is. Now, there's another body. We discussed yesterday. And this is the one we have to understand with Tara. There's another type of body that the Buddhas manifest in. And that's called, you know, it's, it's, it's in the Mahayana one. Generally speaking, we can talk about the Mahayana here, certainly. And then Tantrayana. And it's a body. It's, a, it's called the enjoyment body. Sambhogakaya. The enjoyment body. And it's called that. And it's a subtle light body. And only Arya Bodhisattvas can see it. The ones who, the Bodhisattvas are on certain stages of their own development, they've realized emptiness, and the st stages from there on, there's like 10 stages till they get to Buddhahood. They can, con they can see this. And even the greatest yogis, like Tsongkhapa, our 14th century lineage Lama, he was able to communicate directly with Manjushri in his subtle light body, you know. The Buddha of Wisdom got his teachings directly. So this is where we completely come into, I mean, you know, the Buddhism, and there are thousands and thousands of different Buddhas, leave the Christians for dead, I promise you, in terms of fan ideas of subtle living beings, beings at a subtler level. The Buddhas have the most extensive, you know, people. The Catholics have the saints. There's only one God. There's only one Buddha for them. There's not, and there's only one manifestation. It was called Jesus, and he died on the cross. I'm not being sarcastic, I'm just talking. But for the Buddha, there are billions of manifestations. The lowest level bodhisattva, the lowest level bodhisattva of the 10 stages of, of bodhisattva, as Lama Zopa says, they can already manifest their mind in 100 different forms simultaneously. I mean, this is complete science fiction, you know, for us materialists. But these teachings, are, these are all, they all are the, are, the, are the basis of the understanding of what a Buddha is and how the Buddha's manifest the benefit of sentient beings. So, of course, it's difficult to understand this. You know, in, in our modern world, you, you, you wouldn't want to talk about it with your family. You know, you'd be embarrassed. I've never had these discussions with my family in 45 years. I've asked about, they've asked me about four questions, I think. I don't bother. Who cares? I don't need to know what I think. So it's, like a sci it's like a world of science fiction, the way B the Buddhist view, the Mahayana view, all the different Buddhas and trillions of Buddhas, you know, like I said yesterday. So there are trillions. There's one, there's one Dharmakaya, you can speak of it as a unitary thing, but there are billions of manifestations. So if, if the low, one person, if the lowest level of bodhisattva, one person can manifest in 100 bodies simultaneously, and by the time they come, become to be a Buddha, they can manifest in countless bodies throughout countless universes for countless eons for the sake of countless sentient beings. So we talk, I mean, you read the King of Prayers. We might even recite that before we finish. It's, very, it's outrageous, amazing, marvelous aspiration, you know, bodhisattva aspiration. But the point is this, 
All of it is in the literature and it can be proved theoretically. We have to look at it as actual knowledge that's coming from experience, that's not coming from on high, is not revelation and can therefore be proved and therefore can be known experientially by every one of us as we complete the path. This is the point in Buddhism. So faith is obviously playing a massive role, but it's got to be faith based on intelligence. Based on your own, this is that, that evolution from wrong view to, to correct belief to inferential certainty to direct experience. It's a gradual, gradual, gradual. First starting with, and this is where we have to understand the mind. We live at the, we, you know, Buddha talks about how we have, when you study the mind in high school, in the middle scope, you, there's a little text that you can study, and that's the basis of the teachings. I forget what text it comes from. What's the source? Yuana, what's the source of the Lori? What's that source? Abhidharma, which one is it? Where does all the stuff about the mind come from? Yurana. What's the base? What's the text of the the, the the all the literature about the mind comes from? Yurana, Abhidharma. Yes, Abhidharma, isn't it? No, I actually I think it's Abhidharma, but yes. it's also the Pramana Vartika. Also the Pramana. Oh, is it Pramana? Is it? The and I mean this. Okay. Yeah, it's valid cognition. Oh, okay. So that comes from that's a pram that's pram that's Pramana, isn't it? You aren't studying the basic. Are you studying the basic program or which one are you studying? Master's program. Which one is it? The, the master's Okay, program. in Italy. She's in Italy. Institute Ramos Sankara. So it's interesting. Two days ago, did you see His Holiness? Wisdom has published the second volume of this whole body of teachings that His Holiness has really been inspired to do. And Jigeshi Tupton Jinpo lives in Canada, is the, is, the, is, the, is, the, is the series editor. Of all, Have you looked into those books, Joanna? Have you looked at those books? You know what I'm talking about? You should have them as your books no, to study. I haven't looked at them. Well, you should. You must. You never heard of them? The books they're publishing. No, I heard about them, but I haven't. Okay. Well, the, the other one, the second one, just come out, and there's a lovely on on, on YouTube with His Holiness on the Zoom meeting with him and Wisdom Publications, and it's just and I mean Jim Jinpa said this is His Holiness' his greatest gift to the world. You know, if he wants a legacy, he said he wouldn't want a legacy. He's a monk, but this is just marvelous. This, all these books coming. There are four, going to be four volumes, which is presenting all this incredible knowledge coming from the Indians to the Western world, who know nothing about what these Indians think, you know, nothing. But this incredible detailed discussion about incredible si science of the mind, literally unbelievably sophisticated knowledge about the mind and how it functions. So when you study the mind, you study two things. You study the epistemological model, the way the mind functions, the way the mind functions, which is itself unbelievably fascinating. Western scientists will be so blissed out to study this, but they've got a first possible the possibility that they're not talking about the brain. Then you have the psychological model, and, we're, and, we're gonna, and we've begun to discuss that one. But the epistemological model, you learn about how we've got two different levels of capacity for cognition. We've got what they call, con we've got s sensory consciousness. There's one way of presenting. We've got sensory consciousness. And as far as the Buddha's concerned, it's just like dumb animals, as Lama Yeshi says, you know, the, yeah, there's basically limited, profoundly limited level of cognition. Eye consciousness can, you know, cognize shape and color. Ear can, can cognize sound. And then we've got, and then we've got the mental consciousness, and and we've got two different ways that the mental consciousness functions. And this is the point I'm getting to. At the the level we are existing now, in these bags of bones, in these bodies, in these sensory bodies of ours, we we have conceptuality. That's all we posit in our culture. Think about it. We know we've got certain levels of the mind function when we dream, but it's too weird, and nobody, and nobody in psychology has any agreement about what part of us it is. You know. So we've got conceptuality, and that's that's the level we function at. So all of our emotions, our anger, our love, our hate, our jealousy, our being good at music, all is all conceptuality. And this is the biggest shock in the world because when we th when we think of conceptuality in our modern views of the mind, we think up here kind of rational thinking, and then we point down here for what we call emotions. But as far as Buddha's concerned, they're all based on conceptuality. And this is something, if you can't understand this, even theoretically, you don't understand Buddha's view of the mind at all. And if you can't understand this, you cannot understand Tantra. Not a possibility. It's not a possibility. This is impossible. You've got to go to high school and learn about the mind first. You've got to. You can't just leap over it. So then there's a, then there's a subtle level of cognition. And that's what we can access when we get single point of concentration. It's necessarily subtler, and therefore we don't ever access that level. We maybe touch on the outer edges of some kind of intuition, you know. 
But we don't go anywhere near these subtle levels of cognition, which we absolutely have to understand first theoretically by studying it. And then when we get concentration in the sutra teachings, get using the amazing Hindu technique called single point of concentration. And then when we get to Mahayana, we get to the tantric ones, then the techniques there can make the mind even more subtle, more powerfully, more quickly. And in order to get anywhere, we have to get our mind to that subtle level. So you've got to posit that possibility. Back at the high school, you had to learn that, the Buddha's view of the mind and how it functions. So conceptuality is simply learning about how. It's like thoughts about things. It's not direct cognition at all. We have these elaborate concepts. Our mind is full of these elaborate concepts. And we've, had, we've brought these from us from eons of practice. So we can divide all those concepts into valid concepts, Two simple categories. Well, there's sort of three, but we'll forget the third one. The two, we've got concepts that are up, up, that are ridiculous, that are misconceptions, that are deluded, that causes suffering and causes to harm others. And then we've got concepts that are valid concepts. On, we're on the right direction. You know, they're valid concepts. So we have to learn about how the mind functions. So then we, then in tantra, you learn about where was I? Back on faith. I've got to stick on to the work. I keep going to stick to the Buddha. Okay. So then this Buddha, so these Buddhas, Buddha, the mind becomes the Buddha. The mind becomes the Buddha. And then out of their power, they, out of their compassion, they're able to manifest in these bodies, either a body looking like you and me or a more subtle light body. So in order to understand this, you've also got to, and this is what's taught in Tantra, you have to understand how the universe exists. It, there's a particular presentation in Tantra that describes all the physical world is made of the four elements. That's how we used to talk back in the Middle Ages in our culture. But now we've got these millions of other elements, haven't we? But this is the view in the Vajrayana, and this is the same view of the, the Tibetan medical system uses, that the physical universe is made of the four elements. That's it, the four elements. And then there's mind. And, and then all beings... All beings have a mind and a body. So all of our, so the, these four elements, our mind is inextricably linked. Every mind in the universe is inextricably linked to its own set of the four elements. And this is fundamentally, uh, this is understood in the, it's taught in the Vajrayana. And as I said, the Tibetan doctors, the, the Tibetan system, medical system is, is based upon this idea. So we've got these four elements. So then we've got, when we talk about the death process, and this is the, the, this is the system that the, the meditators have to go through, when they die, when they go through in their own meditation, we go from the grosser level of consciousness. The grosser level is the senses, the body, the bag of bones here. And then, then we and our, and our sensory consciousness is linked to this gross body. When that ceases at the time of death, then that's the fourth stage of the eight stages, and then that's ceased. Then you're, then you're now, after you've stopped breathing, which is when you're ready for the body bag for our culture, but no, not now, we're not dead yet, you've got subtler levels of cognition. That's your subtle consciousness. So your subtle consciousness is mostly your mental consciousness. So all your thoughts and feelings and emotions, that's subtle, actually. And that's inextricably linked to the, all the 72,000 coursing through these 72,000 subtle channels in your nervous system, in your body, and these wind energies are coursing through that, all these different, pra, uh, what they call prana, wind energy, the subtle wind, subtle physical energy, and it's in it, all these winds are linked to your different states of mind. So when you go to your Tibetan doctor and she feels your pulses, she'll feel the imbalance of particular winds, and she knows it's related to your attachment. That's why you're having panic attacks, you know? She can feel the imbalance. And this is also why, as Lama Zopa said, in the Kala Chakra Tantra, they have these they have extensive details. They describe in great detail the, the intimate relationship between internal and external energy. So internal is mind. External is the elements, the physical, and in this case, the subtle physical, coursing through all these channels in our body. And they're utterly linked. And he said, because, so every time you're even just a thought, even just a thought, like you're angry, let's say, that's just mind. You mightn't even express it with your mouth. Just the mind, angry. That naturally, first of all, karmically grows the tendency in your mind to keep being angry. That's one of the most basic ways karma works, the habit to keep doing it. But what it does is it, it impacts upon the wind energies connected to that anger. And that's your physical, and that's your subtle physical. So what that does is pollute the wind energies, and eventually, karmically, that creates the cause to get sick. Sickness is the imbalance of the wind energies. And what causes it? The mind, negative states of mind, cause illness. Not your boyfriend. Your own anger pollutes your winds and eventually that manifests as you get sick. And then even in turn over longer periods, and we're talking about lifetimes now, 
in turn, it creates the cause for you to get born to a mummy who's got the genes to get cancer. So you get cancer. That's due to your past harming. And then eventually, even it impacts upon the external universe. And then you have an imbalance of the external elements. Like right now, look at the world. Pollution. Look at, you know, unbelievable. This is all the result of the negative thoughts and actions of the countless billions of sentient beings who are this second experiencing it. So all this is a marvelous way to understand karma. And it's explained in the Vajrayana model, you know, which is where Tara fits. It's very delicious, you know, little bits like this. Little bits that help you put the pieces of the puzzle together, you know. So the physical world is also beginningless. As His Holiness said when he's in all these conversations with these scientists, Big Bang, no problem. Just not the first Big Bang, that's all. But we all want a first moment. We're looking back for like a needle in a haystack. Oh, there it is. There's the first cause. Well, you can't by definition, a cause can't have a first cause. It's a contradiction in terms. It's a bizarre idea. A cause by definition has come, you know, pre, pre, is coming from a previous effect. An effect is, a, is the cause for the next one. So if you go back 40 trillion years looking for the first moment of you, Buddha says you won't find it. Not because you're not clever, but because it doesn't exist. And, you, and universes have, have stopped. Universes are beginning this as well. This is kind of demented for our minds. So we've got to start positing this possibility because we're intellect, we're clever. We're very intellectually clever. It's not too difficult to think these thoughts. It's just we don't like to because we, they, they're bumping into the views we have already. You know, the Buddha would say our misconceptions. So with that understanding, this subtle understanding of these elements and, and how the mind impacts upon the elements, it won't understand other realms of existence. We won't understand how you can become a Buddha, a Tara, you know. Not possible, not possible, not possible. So there's Buddha. You know, so the word Buddha, the mind, the omniscient mind. Then there's millions of manifestations of Buddha in the Namanakaya form. And then you've got the Sambhogakaya form. So this is where this tantra comes in. So we see all these, you know, like I said yesterday, these thousands of strange looking people with arms and legs and light bodies and green and colors and male and female. And there's utter confusion to us, utter confusion, utter confusion. I have no idea how to f fit all this. Well, they're, they're the manifestation at a subtle level of Buddha mind, you know. So basically, this is the other one about the teacher, the necessity for a teacher and understanding what a Buddha is. These two have to come together. So at the time of Shakyamuni, you would not have known he's a Buddha. So what, on what basis would you then decide to follow him? On what basis would you decide, I'm going to learn from this person, as opposed to the sadhu down the road? You've done your research. You've done your checking. You've confident. You've listened. Like he said, don't just believe what I say. Check me out. You listen to his teachings. And that's, so what can we do now? As Lama, as Lama Yeshi says, Buddha's dead. There's no Shakyamuni around now. He's dead. So what do we do? This is why we need a teacher now. This is the logic of a teacher. He said the teachings only become real for you. The Four Noble Truths become real for you when you, when you hear them from another person who is the Buddha for you. Now that makes sense. That completely makes sense. So then, but, you know, in other words, one of the things we have in the Western world, we say, we, oh, we say there is science. Over there, there's science. People have proved it, we say. Therefore, we believe in it. But that's complete superstition. We don't even think we believe it. We think it's science. But who's, who's proven E equals MC squared? I mean, a few people might have. Well, until you've proven it, it's not real for you. Until you've proven it, it's not real for you. It's just belief. But we never think that way. We think because Fred down the road proved E equals MC squared and we know that it's in a book somewhere. We haven't even checked on his book. Other people say he's done it. So we believe everybody. That's just laziness. That's intellectual laziness. One plus one is two is, is just mere belief until you've proven it yourself. So that's all. So the same with the Buddha. Exactly the same. Buddha is also telling us that this has all been proved. It's in the literature. But we just don't believe it. We don't think it's possible to believe it. So we just close the door to it. Oh, that can't be possible. Don't be ridiculous. So you've got to check up, and it's not easy to check up. You've got to have real intelligence to check up, you know. So how do you do how do you do that now in this life? So and why do you need a teacher? And therefore, and, and if the teacher and also, why do you need a teacher, number one, and number two, the teacher's the Buddha. As far as this view is concerned, the teacher has to be the Buddha. So how do you get your head around that? You know? And why do you need a teacher? And why do you need to see the teacher as a Buddha? These are hugely important things. I mean, I'm going all different around the circles here, different ideas. But that's the crucial one I want to talk about. So I want some questions for you first, though, before we start going into that. 
and I'll stay on, stay on track. Why do we need a teacher and why do we have to see the teacher? Not have to, but what's, what's the necessity? What is the advantage? What is the benefit to me? Why is it necessary for me to see the teacher as a Buddha? What's the logic of that? We have to look at the logic of it. But before that, I want you to ask some questions. I have a question. Who's I? Where are we? It's Stephanie. Where? Yeah. There you go, sweetie. I see you. Yeah. Good. So Talk to me. It's, it's, it's kind of a comment and a question at the same time. Why? So I have a PhD in material science. I'm a physicist. Yes. And to get my PhD, I had to have an advisor. Yes. And I could only get my PhD when he and my committee said, okay, fine. We yes. believe you figured this out. There You've you done go. this. Okay. And, uh, you know, my advisor was delightful because one day I came and I brought him some data and he said, you know more about this than me. You're done. Okay. And that was really fun. Right. But why in religion? Sorry, what? We, what? Why, why do we have to? So no one ever says to me, oh, Stephanie, you're in a cult because you have an advisor who told you. That's right. You precisely. Know, precisely. Why, why do you think it's different in religion? That's, that's what I'm curious about. I know. I think because we, we, we think it's, it's just me. I think it's because we don't think it's real knowledge. We don't think it's real, and we don't think it can be proved. We think it's me. So that's the. I don't, surely, is that not the point? It's, it's either belief or it's real. That, that's so. That's how we feel. But the, the point is, the view here I'm trying to get to is more nuanced. That would be true in religion. You can't prove that God is God because that means you're God. So that would be wrong to say that. So you need to say you have great. You have faith in God. Yeah, believe in God. So as we can see from the material, I mean, look at the evolution of science coming back from who's that clever man who talked about how the sun didn't go around the, not the Greek one. Who's the clever Italian scientist? Galileo. Galileo. That yeah. clever fellow, he practically got burned at the stake, didn't he? Because he dared to question what was seen as absolute truth, didn't he? Was, wasn't that the idea with him? And that's the evolution. Is this not the evolution in our culture now, how we've now split into two? We've got religion over here, which is really all just mere belief and can't be proved. And now we have the hard sciences that can be proved. Is that true? Would that be true, Stephanie? It's like that, isn't it? That is true. But yeah. I, I mean, even in science, uh, if, if you. If you say something that doesn't fit uh, what, what is accepted by many, okay. you okay. become a heretic. Okay, there you go. So it's really the same. So that's that's <laughs> very now that's very fascinating because that's pointing in the Buddhist view, and that's why we get to the cult thing. Why? Well, I mean, look at some of the cults. I mean, I'm fascinated by the way minds go into these concrete realities. I mean, it's looking at recently looking at the Netflix series about Scientology. How, you know, these views, I mean, communism is a bunch of really interesting viewpoints. Scientology also has very interesting viewpoints. Seventh-day Adventists, anybody can have really interesting viewpoints, but what is it in us that causes us to stultify it and concretize it and become fanatic and, 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 and demented? And that, for the Buddha, is called ego grasping. That's the, the root delusion called ignorance that has the tendency to set things in stone. And that... And then, we, and because we're all attached to our own views, and there you go, you're proving it in science. Because it's established views, people don't want to be saying the wrong thing, so you start, you start to get fundamentalist, you know. And that's just the, that's the character of the mind with ignorance. That's the nature of ignorance in the mind to stay stuck in something, and this is right and you're wrong. That's that's the view, that's the one that causes all the suffering. So that's the cause of all of it. So the one of so that this is why it's so interesting. I mean, I remember one of my. Yeah, that we just we have these assumptions, basically, Stephanie, layers of assumptions that we never question, and which the Buddha's view is suggesting we must start to question and unpack. And the assumption is that there's an assumption in the modern, you know, the philosophical materialist world that um, that anything you can't, you know, roughly speaking, anything that you can't see or that's called religion can't be proved. So that's it. That's the one. So you know, then you're and then you're an idiot, you know. Then you're a fool. You're an idiot. You can't because you can't prove it. But the Buddha's point is. But if you can't prove it, it doesn't exist. It's not true. That's the fundamental Buddha. In, in, in Buddhism, when you study philosophy, you study, there are several synonyms for that which exists. You start with these, with, there's a term called object, object of knowledge, existent, established base. There's about five synonyms for that which exists. And why Buddha's concerned with this is because he says, right now, we're living in la-la land, believing in things that don't exist. So even, even though we all think we're so intelligent, we believe the cake will make us happy. I believe that boyfriend will make me happy. Buddha says that's a misconception. It's just rubbish. You're believing in something that doesn't exist. So the, the, the definition of that, the, the definition of an existent 
is that which can be cognized by mind. So for Buddha, it's axiomatic. If mind can, cognizes it and it's a valid cognition, that is the very proof of its existence. So this is, this is an utterly r rigorous, incredible kind of thing that, will f that is just huge in Buddhism, not because someone said it. That's the belief in Christianity. Mm -hmm. So we've got, that's what we've got to prove, but we can only prove it one step at a time, isn't it? No, it's true. You're not in a cult because you've got, you're, you're, called, you're in the body called science, even though you know. And just because, also, I think, Stephanie, because we we want to be in the group that's the most popular. So these days, science is the most popular. So we want to be in the right group. You want to be in the right mob. You're in the right mob, baby. But if suddenly science, yeah. like if you're a scientist in a in a, in, a, in um, if you're you know a, a philosophical materialist in a fundamental in a fundamental in a, in a Christian village where they're only Christians, you'd you'd be the bad person. You'd be the person who's burned on the stake. So it depends on where we are. And because we all crave to be approved of and want to be seen to be the right person, then we're so craven. We have no courage at all to question. That's why the scientists who think out the box are so marvelous because they're brave enough to think beyond the normal. You know. Do you understand what I'm saying? But yeah. it's very interesting, isn't it? Yeah, there's yeah. a hand there. Thank you, Stephanie. Well, yes, Denise. Thank you. What, darling? Yes, Denise. Uh, uh, sh Denise. Can you hear me? Um, oh, hang on. Uh, yeah. That's what's so radical and wonderful about what the Dalai Lama is doing right now with this book series and an opening. I mean, he is being without people consciously knowing he is being the Buddha for the universe, is that right? Well, I mean, he is, but he's not saying that. He's. I think he can make it more. No, of course I mean, not. Of course, Karen. No, of course. But I mean, the, the Western the materialists wouldn't. I would say what he's doing is using his amazing, marvelous kindness and bringing groups together and finding the common ground. So, getting scientists to start actually looking into things that they would have thought once was superstition. That's his incredible humility and skill, isn't it? Yes, that's right. Books, but, absolutely. but, but what? Yeah. Well, I'm just saying that he's he's taking the realm of 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 um, Buddhism into um, psychology, which is science and, and making it a science right in front of our eyes uh, for all to open their consciousness in a broader way. That's I right. mean, exactly. whether they're Buddhist or not. No, that's right. Exactly. You're absolutely right. Yes, Karen, I agree with you. It's marvelous, isn't it? It's wonderful. So you had a question, Denise, yes. There's a, good morning. There's a really cool video with His Holiness hosting what, top scientists. And they're talking about scientific theory and how things have to be provable. And there has to be this, um, the, His Holiness points out, but he says, you know, you're talking about material science in order to be proved. And so he asks the scientists, if every time an egg meets a sperm is life created and the scientists answer no and then he postulates that there must be a consciousness then that becomes involved to choose to have that material coming together become a human life so what do the scientists say then what's their view about what? that say it again what's the scientists view about that the scientists kind of stop yeah, but what do they say? It. What's their view, then? There, there is that they can't prove it because they don't study something beyond material. Oh, that's right. Exactly. Of course, that's right. And that's see, that's why for me that's the crucial point. That's why if we understand right. this ever, that's why if we can, in order to begin understanding Buddhism, it's a bit catch twenty two. You know, you, if you can't prove, if you can't act, you know, the subtler level of your mind is what has a direct experience of these truths. So then if you can't even posit the possibility that mind has subtler levels, which means you have to posit the possibility that the brain is not involved, then you, you, it's a catch-22. You, you can't prove that first. That's why you've got to take it as a hypothesis. That's why I think any decent scientist first takes something as a hypothesis. You've got to have this openness. And then you've got to go through gradually the stages of proving it first and theoretically and then experientially. So it is a long process. I mean, it's going to be until you've got single point of concentration, until you've got shamatha, you can't, you can't have a direct cognition of the... You can't have clairvoyance. Clairvoyance is seeing the past and the future. Clairvoyance is seeing the minds of others. Clairvoyance is a natural potential of mind at a subtler level, and that's all posited in Buddha's teachings. So, you, you know, you, to even, so you've got to start positing the possibility of these subtle levels of mind before you even begin... And that's, and our trouble is in the West. 
those of us who like Buddhism, because obviously the Buddhists here because we've done Buddhism before and we come into this life with a karmic imprint. So we just kind of tumble into Buddhism. Oh, I like Buddhism. Well, our trouble is we conflate liking it with knowing it. So most of us don't study. So then it's, got, it's going to run out eventually. Next life, you, it'll, you, you, I mean, even you can even now in this life, if you don't keep studying, your, your interest will run out. It'll just the, the petrol tank will run out. So if you want to continue, you've got to study it. You've got to know this. Just believing in it's not enough. Like, can you imagine saying you believe in botany? People would laugh at you. But you have, or believing in mathematics. It, you can get away with believing in it because so many people can count. But if your mother says, go buy five, me buy, buy five oranges, you can't do that because you have to rely on someone else to tell you. You have to have faith that it's five. But you, when you know it's five, then you're getting somewhere. So we have to study. We have to have the knowledge one step at a time. Believing in it's not enough. Ha you just, believing in it and liking it are not enough. It'll run out eventually. You know. and that's any knowledge. We can see that. So it's up to us. And as His Holiness says, if we follow Buddha's methodology, because basically, I always quote this, you know, in New Zealand, a, a man asked the question, it's the first time I've ever been asked it, and I haven't been asked it since, and he happened to be a scientist. He said, who revealed the teachings to the Buddha? Which is the exact correct question if you're talking about Christianity. By definition, the knowledge is revelation. By definition, it is not experiential, it's revelation. That's the point. So he was very shocked when I said, would you, would you ask who revealed, you know, the teachings to Einstein? We would never ask that question because we know he used his noggin. We know it's direct experience. We assume that about science. Well, that's the same assumption with Buddhism. So I said, you know, there is revelation. You can think about it. The great yogis can have discussions with the Buddha. They can be revealed the teachings through their, in their mind. But, you know, the knowledge of Buddhism that's in the books that has to be knowledge we can track back to the mind of a person who's experienced it. If it's not, it's superstition. But we take that for granted. You read a cookbook. You know perfectly well that you know Mary Smith wrote the cookbook. We can assume first that it's her own direct experiential knowledge. She made those cakes. And I mean, cooks make cakes 27 times before they dare to put the recipe in the book. They've got to be valid. She, or it's her mother's recipes, in which case she'll honour her mother and say, I can't cook anything, but here's my mum's recipes. So she honours someone else. But we know usually it's the person who wrote the book and that everything in that book is coming from her own experience. We don't question that. And then we discover she didn't really make the cakes. We'll call her a fraud and we'll throw her out the door. But, you know, religion. A Westerner goes to a weekend meditation course and has a vision and has a meditation experience and they write a bloody book about it. I mean, we're so rude. It's so arrogant and so childish and so unintelligent, you know. But that's what we think of religion. Oh, I can believe what I like, we say. I mean, it's beyond idiotic to think like that. It's just unbelievable ignorance, you know. So Buddha's either right or is wrong. Buddha can only, there's only two options. It's either right or it's wrong. Mind is either physical or it's not. And if mind has got subtle levels, it's either true or it's not. And emptiness is either true or it's not. So what do we have to do with it? You, to, you, can, you can study it and believe in it all and stick it in your head. And that's fine, better than nothing, but it won't tick, trickle down to your heart. It won't affect you the way you are. And that's our trouble with knowledge in our culture as well. You know, like Stephanie could be the most brilliant scientist on the planet and know everything about, you know, everything, but she can go home and beat up her children because that won't help her become a better person because her knowledge is not based in ethics. And that's our big problem in the West. We, we, we see it as intellectual cleverness, you know. The best artist on the planet can be the most abusive person. But for the Buddha, you can't have wisdom without ethics. It's not possible, literally not possible. And it's not meaning you, you've got to have it, but you can't have it. You wouldn't have wisdom if you didn't have ethics. And you could not have, you could not have it. You just couldn't. It's not possible because they all come together. So this knowledge we're talking about is real knowledge, but you've got to, take, you've got to be patient. It's, it's got, not going to be several lifetimes where you prove it all. So you've got to go one step at a time, have a long-term view, you know. So as His Holiness said, if you, if you do practice Buddhism and you, and, you, and you tick the boxes as you go, you, start, you study junior school, you pass junior school, then you pass high school, you go one step at a time and you tick the boxes as you go. And if you get to a certain point where you discover from your own direct experience that Buddha's wrong, of course you would reject him. That's what he did with the Hindus. He got to the, as far as he could go, to the highest peak of samsara, and he found there was still more to remove from the mind. There's still more delusions to remove from the mind. And that's where he diverged in his own direction. So it's pretty intense. But you've got to start somewhere. You've got to start with a hypothesis. Any scientist would start with a hypothesis. What if it's possible that one plus one is two? Let's look into it. And be very patient and humble. Go one step at a time, you know. So back to the Buddha 
and a teacher and why we need one and why it's crucial. Well, you know, you think about it. I think anything we've learned in our lives since we're born, we've learned it from a person who knew how to do it. And surely that's the quickest, most intelligent way to learn something, isn't it? You could reinvent the wheel, but how arrogant, you know? I mean, I'm not going to learn from my mother how to make a cake. I'm going to invent it myself. You'd probably spend $100 million to have to, to look at a thing called a chocolate cake, you know, and try and deduce what the, what the contents are. And then you have to make your own. How clever. No, just ask your mum. She'll show you. Quick. So then you have to... So then, and I, that's why I'm, I don't know if I've, you've heard me say this before, but I've always used that simple example for me of when I first learned how to make a cake. It's a perfect example of exactly the approach of how to find a spiritual teacher. So Buddha said, don't just believe what I say. Check up what I'm saying. Check it up. So what can you check up? You can't, if I've not even studied one plus one is two, I cannot check yet that E equals MC squared. I can't. It's too advanced. So you've got to start where you are. And that means, because, so with, and this is a really the point with my mum with the cakes. I'd never made a cake before. I was 25 and it first occurred to me. And this is why the first step is this one. The first step is you've got to want it. You know you can bring a horse to water, you can't make him drink. You've got to want to learn that. You've got to want. I mean, I know when I first went to my first teachings with Lama Yeshi, I didn't know I wanted to get enlightened. I'd never heard of such a term. But, you know, that's, where, that's why we've got to rely upon our past karma and past virtuous karma, fortunately. That, you know, I was, I was moving along and then this condition, this certain conditions arose in my life where suddenly I had nothing else to do. So then I saw a poster and I was attracted to this person's name. So it wasn't intelligence that drove me there. It was my past karma, my past karma from my past merit that drove me to go to Chen Raising Institute to this course with Lama Zopa and Lama Yeshi, you know. But from that, pro from that point, hearing their teachings, that's when the process started, listening. First I had an intuitive feeling. This seemed right. I, I, I recognised, it was like a recognition, which makes sense when you think about karma. I've done it before. I mean, it's not just holy. I remember reading a 19-year-old white supremacist when, he first, when I first read Hitler. Wow, I found I'd come home, he said. Everything made sense. Why? Because it was already in his mind. Why? Because he's thought it before. He's got a tendency towards those views. So the same with me when I went to Lamieshi. I had a tendency already in my mind. So I heard the teachings and they, they, and they, they triggered a, a recognition. But I had to persevere and then start to use my intelligence. So with my mum and with Lamieshi, it was the same thing. My mum, I decided, I'd go, I was living in London as a hippie and I wanted to make a carrot cake. I remember vividly the thought. Oh, I'm going home to Melbourne anyway, I'll ask mum. But why did I ask mum? Because I'd done my market research. I'd tasted her cakes. I'd tasted her students' cakes. Her peers had checked her peers. They said she was good. So the point is, why do I have to use that knowledge to help me have confidence in my mother? It's so simple because I had no direct experience of making cakes. I couldn't, if she said to me, put in 32 eggs, I would have no basis for judging if she's right or wrong. So you can only rely on intellectual knowledge. I didn't have experiential knowledge. I had to rely on intellectual knowledge. That means you check the student, you check the product, you go to the Lama's teachings. I'd been to Lama Yeshi's teachings. I'd spent two months there. I'd done my checking. I checked his students. He was, I checked his main disciple, Lama Zopa, who himself was seen as the best cake maker. So I had a lot of, you know, valid experiences that gave me confidence that Lama Yeshi was reasonable. I couldn't tell from his own words, because I had no experience yet. I couldn't tell if his words were right. That's not possible. I could not tell if my mother, when she said six eggs or 62 eggs, I would never know because I had no direct experience. So what, that's why you could have inferential certainty, which is intellectual knowledge. What else can you do? There's no choice. It's up to you. But we don't think that. We just jump in and we follow attachment. No wonder so many people in the, over the years in the West get into big trouble with, with gurus because we jump in with attachment. We think, oh, he must be so special. Wow, he's so charismatic. Wow, he makes me feel so good. And I tell you, even with his holiness, who has checked up on his holiness? Nobody. We just Because he's, he's, he's the biggest Buddhist around. Everyone seems to love him, so we think we're in the right mob. We think we're in the right group. Oh, yeah, I, I like the Dalai Lama. Oh, he, he likes Dalai Lama. Oh, I like Dalai Lama too. But what, what checking have we done? Have we checked up on him? Just because he makes you feel good is not good enough. I'm sorry. I mean, I, I'm going to say something now that so shocks people, but I want to say it. Suddenly, can you imagine if Dalai Lama disrobed and, and, and had a 16-year-old girlfriend? Please hear my words now. No, I would suggest 99% of the world would give him up and say he's a phony. 
So that shows we haven't checked. So that's okay. I'd be lucky to have a person who can make us feel good and who can be a, gra- a marvellous influence on the planet, including in science and diplomacy and, and everything else. He's an amazing presence. We're happy to have him. But who's checked up on him? Nobody. We just think, you know, so what do we do? What can I do? Well, I've checked up a bit on Lama Zopa and Lama Yeshi, and they say he's the best one. So that's good enough for me. So you've got to use this kind of, that's logic. That's not, that's not emotion. That is logic. If I've checked on Lama Zopa and I've known him for 45 years and Lama Yeshi the same and they haven't led me up a garden path yet, then they say Dalai Lama's the best one. That's good enough logic. That's using logic. Not just kind of, here, is hearsay, but it's pretty good. See, all we can do is use this type of thing, but use our intelligence, be clear, be confident, and then be confident. So with my mum, I did all those things, and I came home, and then she showed me how to make hair. And this is what's interesting. I rem- it's implanted in my mind, it's imprinted in my mind, the moment in the kitchen, the day, the cake, I remember it, because it was the first time the cakes became real for me. As Lama Yeshi said, the Four Noble Truths, the first time it becomes real for you is when you hear it from the mouth of and the lovely word in Tibetan, rigsin, knowledge holder. I heard it from the mouth of a knowledge holder. So then I could, and that's how you pass knowledge on, directly from the mind of the previous person. This is, this is what lineage means. My mother was a musician. Where did she get her music from? Her teacher. Where did they get their music from? Their teacher. Where did they get their music from? You could track it right back to Bach in an unbroken chain of real knowledge holders. That's powerful, you know. That's knowledge. And then, based upon your research, based upon your due diligence, then you, know, and I, uh, that, then you, you, you take that knowledge inside you. And I heard, I, I haven't made a cake in 30 years, maybe 20. I bet you I could make a good cake because that knowledge went into my mind. It became real for me and I remember it and I did what she said because I checked. I didn't say when she said, well, get two eggs, darling, and whip them. Why not six? How do you know what you're talking about? Why would I do that? I'd done my checking. So So what did I do? I had faith in my mother. I trusted my mother, but not blind faith. That's the difference. It's intelligence. I'd done my checking. So Lama Yeshi the same. I went to this teaching, you know, and I liked immediately, but that's not enough. So I checked, I looked at his students. I was there for two months. I looked at Lama Zopa. He was the best example of the best student. You couldn't argue with him. He looked so holy. Lama Yeshi looked like a relaxed and funny and didn't look like a holy person. But Lama Zopa looked totally holy and everybody had devotion in him. So you know, I checked the students, I checked the teachers. And then it took me a year though. It took me six months to, for, for the penny to drop. I liked Lama Yeshi. I'd done the checking, I read his teachings. And then six months later in Melbourne, the penny dropped. And it was in the mid 70s, and I mean, I'd been a radical lesbian, separatist, feminist. I'd been in radical politics, you know. So the most disgusting idea was to have a guru. I felt so embarrassed. And I whispered to my sister Polly, I've got a guru, Polly, but don't tell anybody, you know. So then I went back to Chen Raising Institute the, uh, that six months later, so after one year of seeing him first. And I didn't know you're supposed to ask, so I informed Lama Yeshi that he was my guru. I didn't know he was supposed to ask. I was so arrogant. He said, yes, I know, dear. And this is the point now. This is the point now. Can you imagine with my mum? This is the whole point. <clears throat> my mum could see since I was a little girl. I showed zero interest in cakes. I liked her music. I learned music from her. I wanted her music. Yeah, she taught me singing. But cakes, no interest. I never did any cooking. I never did any... I was very rude. I didn't do any cleaning. I was lazy. I didn't, do, I didn't clean the house. didn't clean the dishes, you know. But cakes, no interest. So can you imagine when she took me by the scruff of my neck? Even if she could see I could be good at cake making, and she took me by the scruff of my neck and she forced me to make a cake. We know that doesn't work. So she was very humble and patient and waited for 25 years, or 20 years maybe. And then finally I asked her, please, Mum, show me how to make a cake. Can you imagine how happy she was? Because my mind was ready. So it's a, con- it's a whole coming together of a series of things. First one is you have to want it. Then you do your checking. Then you ask. And my mum, of course, she was so happy to, to tell me. And I was ready and willing and in that kitchen. And it's in my mind. I remember the day. I remember the cake. It was an apple and walnut cake. I remember it. It's vivid in my mind. It's the first time cakes became real for me. And who made it ha- that way? Me. My mother always knew how to make a cake. But I had to c- catch up with her. So, can, you know, Lama Yeshi the same. Lama Zopa, for example. A good example for me is Lama Zopa. 
They bo- I met them both together. I recognised Lama Yeshi straight away. I liked Lama Yeshi. I became devoted to Lama Yeshi. I asked him to be my, or I told him, and then eventually blah. And it was 10 years. But my first retreat, after I became a nun a year later, after meeting them, I, 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 did, I, I did a retreat and I had this very vivid dream about Lama Zopa. We're, all, we're at Nalanda Monastery ruins. I didn't know that until I went there years later. You know, this wonderful place near Rajgir, you know, where the Buddha, where this big monastic university was in the 7th, 8th, 9th, 10th century, you know. So anyway, <clears throat> uh, we were all there, a whole bunch of students, and Lama Zoba called me out, and he put a text over one of my shoulders, you know, these long folio texts wrapped in cloth, and his robe over my other shoulder, and he told me to follow him out. And it was a nice dream, but I happened to tell a Lama in Dharamsala, about this dream. And he said, oh, that's the Lama who leads you to enlightenment. And I was shocked because I thought Lama Yeshi was my main guru. And he is now. He has both of them are. But it took me 10 years. From that dream, I knew that intellectually, but my mind wasn't ready. So Lama Zopa left me alone. He didn't force me to make a cake. He left me alone. He ha- you know, my mind had to be ready. This is the most crucial point. I had to be ready. I had to want it. So it took me 10 years to recognize Lama Zopa as my root guru along with Lama Yeshi. 10 years from that first from that dream. I knew it was true, but it took me 10 years to, for my heart to catch up. So he left me alone. He didn't force me. He didn't teach me. He cracked jokes when he saw me. He didn't tell me what to do. But the second my mind was ready, I was at a retreat after Lama Yeshi passed away. I was devastated about Lama passing away. And two years later, I was at a retreat, three years later, in New Zealand. We did a retreat together, a whole bunch of monks and nuns. And uh, and then Lama Zopa called me up to his room at the end of the retreat. And it was and, and then my mind must have been ready after ten years of practice and and I even knew consciously I had to make aspirations for Lama Zopa to be my teacher. So I remember I always have this memory of like Michelangelo, you know, the big god pointing his finger, or is it somebody pointing his finger in that big painting? whatever that is. I have the vision of when Lama Zopa said to me, he told, I didn't know what to do. I'd, I'd finished my job of wisdom. I'd been editing at wisdom for 10 years and doing the production. So that job finished. I had, no, I had no, no idea what I'd do. I didn't know what to do next, you know. I did this retreat and then he called me up to his room and, he, and I always have a memory of him pointing his finger and he said, go to Sydney and teach. Well, I was so shocked. Teach? I only studied a little bit. And he told me to teach. So that was when he, and he, that's when he picked me up and started telling me what to do being my teacher. Lama Yeshi the same, in my first meeting with Lama Yeshi, when I informed him that he was my teacher, because I was too arrogant to say the words, you are my guru, or uh, no, too arrogant to know that I should ask first, never mind, but he, it was that first, that already I could feel it. From that time, and this is how I like to put it, from that time, from that second in that meeting, it was like once I decided he was my teacher, in other words, I had decided, like the cakes, I decided that I wanted Lama Yeshi to be my teacher. So in a sense, what I did was give him permission. In a sense, what I did was I gave my mother permission to show me how to make cakes. Before that, she didn't have my permission. I would not have listened. Think of it like that. I gave Lama Yeshi permission. So from that meeting, I remember the meeting, already just some words he said were a shock to me because he began to show me my mind. And that's the guru's main job. They can teach you cakes, yep. Lama's over taught me how to make a momo. But their job is the mind. That's their expertise. And what do they want to show you? They're going to give you the teachings, yeah. But their real job is to show you your mind so you can see your shitty delusions, you know. And that's what he did in the first meeting. In the first meeting, something happened, you know. That's why I like to say we choose our guru. We give them permission to show us the path to enlightenment. And I can't stress that enough. Because we are the boss in this scenario. Don't misunderstand me. When you read all the literature about the devotion, it sounds contradictory what I'm saying, but I mean it. Because we are the ones who have to lead the way. Your, my, Lama, you know, Lama Zopa left me alone for 10 years because my mind wasn't ready. I hadn't given him permission. My mind had not opened. Now, this is where the point of the meaning of the word devotion. It's so com- uncomplicated. When you're, you're devoted, like you can be devoted to your mother means you see your mother, you love your mother, you want, this is an ordinary relationship, but your heart is open to your mother. Think about this. We have delusions and we have virtues. There's only two options. Okay, there's a third lot, I call them the mechanics, like concentration, good memory. These are like the mechanics of our mind. Forget those. We've got the neurotic, eye-based, deluded, 
disturbing emotions, states of mind, that blind us, that prevent us from not seeing things properly, that cut us off from others. We're like separate. When we're run by those, we are nightmarishly miserable. We can't see anybody and we can't, we, there's no way for the heart, there's no devotion. Devotion is an open heart. So you're gonna, you better open your heart to somebody who's valid, okay? As Pavonka Rinpoche says, you better choose your guru carefully. You're gonna end up like them. So it's not to do with emotion, not to do with attachment. It's rational, it's logical. But the heart, when the heart is open, that means love and compassion and kindness and self-confidence are present. And they are virtuous. And those states of mind connect us with others. So devotion is an open heart. Devotion is, 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 is you can say it's loving someone, that's your mum. But you, know, you, know, you don't say you love your guru. Your guru is somebody whom you, whom you wish to become like. So people revere their teachers. You have a mentor whom you revere. I mean, maybe, you know, even Stephanie reveres her, 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 science, her science teachers. We all understand that relationship. And because we've got a human heart, we need people like that in our lives. But choose them carefully, please. You can give your heart to somebody who won't, who, won't, who won't piss on you. Forgive me, please. Choose a person who's valid. Then you open your heart wide and then you will do everything they say. And why do you do everything they say? Because they want you to know how to make a cake. I opened my heart to my mother and I did exactly what she said because I wanted to make a cake and I had, and I had checked up on her. So all the conditions came together. Same with Lama Yeshi. Same with Lama Zopa. Same with my Kung Fu teacher. It was the same thing. I remember doing karate first when I was in New York and I was a radical feminist and I chose a women's dojo and I loved all the people there and I loved the teacher, but I didn't know she was a, cr a crummy teacher. I didn't choose her properly. So I, I, ran, I learned wrong, it was karate actually. I learned wrong karate for like a year. I didn't know because I chose it for the wrong reason. I didn't do my due diligence. I don't, re 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 I don't resent the period I had there because I, my friends were there. And I was, I was happy to be around these women. So that was where I was at. But she wasn't a good teacher. So only when I went back to Melbourne later and joined another dojo, the same style, and I said I was in the yellow belt or the green or the brown or whatever it was, and then he saw me, it was a man, and I chose this place because it was the same karate, and he saw me do the karate on the first day, and he, see, he told me at the end of the class that I wasn't very good, and I should go back to the white belts. Well, I was really insulted, and then, it, then I realised I didn't do my due diligence with the first teacher. I'd learned wrongly. That's just karate, it's nothing. So can you imagine choosing the wrong spiritual teachers? You, you're going to lose the path for countless lifetimes. You've lost the plot. So it's logical. The way they read it, they talk about it in like 10th century fundamentalism in the Tibetan text, you know. So you've got to see it in a way that we make, that makes sense in our language. It's a, it's, a re, it's a good relationship. It's a healthy one based on your intelligence, based on you wanting. I mean, I look about, I read about sort of sports coaches. People revere their sports coaches. They don't care if they shout at them because they want to, and you know, this is the aspect of us. We want to be loved. So we want someone to look up to. We want someone, but not from a, not from a craven place, not from a victim place. That's revolting. From a healthy place, from a self-confident place, but from a logical place of having checked and used our intelligence, and then you open your heart, and then the quicker you do this, the quicker you'll become a Buddha. And that's why Tsongkhapa says you know, in his first in his text, you know, the foundation of all good qualities. The foundation of all good qualities is the guru. And it makes it's no sense to us. It seems so abstract and fearful. It's logical. Because when your heart's open, you will do, you, you're ready and willing to do anything. But you've got to Choose your guru very carefully. You'll end up like them. So use your noggin first. Use your intelligence. It's unbelievably important. And so then, what time is it? Okay, 11.30. Okay, we've got a bit of time still, haven't we? We should have had a five-minute break. Sorry, never mind. So then, you know, this is... this. Is, so Okay, now I, want, I need to ask more questions about this. For me, it just seems... This is a, a down-to-earth way of talking about it, you know. So are there any questions, please? Because it's so mis mystified, so confusing. Yes, Catherine, sweetie pie. So what if you, you do your checking and you're like, okay, I, I think, you know, this person meets the qualifications mm -hmm. and then maybe you take vows from that person and then... Later, that person starts doing some sketchy stuff, and you're like, maybe I, I made a mistake. No, I know. That's the but, So do you pretend that it's you just kind of 
try to keep that right view in your mind or do you then go, well, let me go take those vows from somebody else instead? Or, I mean, is it no, I understand, contaminated? Catherine. Or? I understand. And this is, this is definitely what? a common occurrence in the West, isn't it? It's a very, you hear it everywhere. People, because there are so many people who, you know, see, who purport to be spiritual teachers. And this is the point, that's why we've got to check so carefully. But it's not that easy. And this is not an uncommon experience, Catherine. It's so common. I mean, so many people come and come with this dilemma. So what's the attitude? What's the view? And this is where it gets tricky. This is where it gets very tricky. So I'll use my, always I'll use my own example, an own experience of my own as the example. And I'll tell you how I try to navigate it and the logic of the way I navigate it and why it's reasonable to do it, what I'm suggesting, which is what the teachings say. So first of all, what is the whole point of all this path? The entire point of this entire path is to lessen your delusions and grow your virtues until you've perfected your mind and you become a Buddha. That's the long-term goal. Do we all agree with that? That's the long-term goal. That's the purpose. And you've got to be clear about that. You've got to be clear about that. You've got to be clear that's the goal. That's if you'd committed to this path. The end result is that path. So if the job you're trying to do is to understand your own delusions, understand your ego grasping, understand the attachment, understand the anger and all the others, and how crucially they are misconceptions. They, and that, that the way that we are at the moment, which is what samsara is, that we see the world through their lenses. We see the world through the lenses of our delusions. So when we make choices based on that, we're a mess. So, okay, we're trying to lessen those delusions, we're trying to get in touch with reality, and we're trying to develop virtue, and eventually the wisdom and the virtue come together and we become a Buddha. That's the goal, long-term goal. That's the goal which we never lose sight of. So, therefore, I have to do everything as every, every second in my life as much as possible not to, get, not to buy into the delusions, not to see things through the lens of delusions. Which is what makes me ang which is anger, attachment, jealousy, fear, and all the, all the other garbage. So, there I was at a centre in England, Lama Yeshi's first centre in Europe. It was about the third centre altogether. The first centre outside of India was Chen Rezig Institute in Australia. He started that in 1974, and then in 1975, I think the centre in England was called Manjushri Institute, and then Vajrapani Institute in uh, in America. They're the first three centres. The three main Buddhas, you know, the manifestation of power, Vajrapani, it's also Tara, manifestation of, Chen Re, of, of compassion, Chen Rezig, and manifestation of, of wisdom, Manjushri. So anyway, there I was, I went up to Manjushri Institute after I became a nun, Lama Yeshi pa, sent all his, disciples, his monks and nuns there, he sent his, his study program, he started this Geshe program there, like the, the, the starting, the, you know, the forerunner of the, of the, of the master's program. He called it the Geshe program. This is back in 1977 or something. And then the, all the monks and nuns were there. We had about 30 of us, and it was an amazing place. So powerful. About 80 people lived there. We had two, you know, two classes, two, two teachers there. It was incredibly powerful. And he said, and Wisdom Publications was there, and that was my job, to work for Wisdom. So it was really intense, really amazing. So the Geshe there that Lama Zopa Lama Yeshi invited, Geshe Kelsang Gyatso, was a fellow disciple of his, of their root guru, a close disciple of their root, a fellow disciple of their, all their, their root guru. So he was the first Geshe that Lama Yeshe invited to the centers to be the resident teacher. And then he invited Geshe Tekjok, who started teaching the Geshe program. So I, st I was living there for five years. But then, you know, you might have heard about this or you might not, but there was this terrible schism that manifested in about 1982, 81, 83, and eventually this huge schism. And basically, the simple facts of the case are not, this is not judgment, these are facts, this is not criticism. Geshe Kelsang Gyatso took the centre, basically. So now it's a, it's his own, he's got his own organisation. And of course, since that time, he's now gone against His Holiness and he started his own, his own tradition, the new Kadampa tradition, and he's got centres all over the world and he's gone against His Holiness. So basically, they're facts. That's not criticism, they're facts. Now, the point is, when I was there, I took initiation from Geshe Kelsang Gyatso. That means he's one of my gurus. I decided I would see him as the Buddha, and I haven't even begun to talk about that one yet. That was the, the ultimate in the practice, to see him as a manifestation in human form of the Buddha. Because this is the point I'm getting to now in the discussions about seeing the Guru as the Buddha, which is crucial in the Vajrayana teachings, okay? And that's why these teachings are very difficult for us if we haven't done the earlier teachings. It's really hard for our mind, you know? It's not, it's just, it just seems like superstition, it's so weird. So the point is, then all this thing happened. He took, so Lama Yeshe and Lama Zopa were my root teachers, my root 
Well, love, yes, yeah, yeah, they were my root teachers. I was devoted to them. I was at their centre. I was doing their wishes. I was, I was working for their, public, their, their wisdom publications. They were my teachers. So then this, this thing happened. And it was the worst experience of my life. It was like a war zone. You know? It was just so painful, so painful, so painful. And Lama Zopa told us at the time, this schism, this division, is the, is the result of breaking our third root tantric vow in past lives, speaking the faults of your Vajra brothers and sisters, meaning a person who's received initiation from the same Lama. So then I, I heard all this. So then I realised due to past karma, we students had created this division. So that already, you can't say those words if you don't have some semblance of confidence in the law of karma. You can't. So I had some semblance of confidence. I'd done some study. I had some confidence in karma. So that was really powerful for my mind, you know, which is why it's so powerful to control our speech. So then what happened was Lama eventually moved wisdom, moved wisdom publications. I left and, I, and I haven't been, I've been back one time since. That was in 1983 or something. So the point is this, to Catherine's point. What am I going to do with this? I'd already decided he was one of my gurus. I took empowerment. You can't take an empowerment in Tantra from somebody without there being your guru. That's why you just, just leap in. You, you check carefully. And then you're committing to practice. And who, and the point is, Catherine, the, be, the, the whole point behind all these teachings is that who is the beneficiary of this approach is me. This is not for Geshe Kelsan Gasso's sake. It's not for anybody else's sake. So what are my choices? The, the fact is this Lama has taken another Lama center. The fact is this person has gone against his holiness Dalai Lama. They're facts. So it's enough to split your head in half and make yourself very depressed and very miserable. But then I realized, due to past karma, I must have created this. I created the cause to be in part of this division. I created the cause for my own bad-mouthing and disharmony in a past life to be part of the cause of this disharmonious schism, this schism, this split in a community. So what am I going to do? How am I going to see Geshe Kassan Gyatso now? Well, now, this is where logic comes in. When we, and this is the Bodhisattva teachings, forget the Vajrayana teachings, but just the Bodhisattva teachings are completely outrageous. By the time you get to becoming a Bodhisattva, you, 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 your delusions are pretty subdued. You might even have realised emptiness. You're a pretty stunning, unbelievable person. And what drives a Bodhisattva is this powerful compassion to go from life to life only to benefit others. They're way beyond being controlled by their attachment and their aversion. That means even in the Bodhisattva vows, you have a vow in the Bodhisattva vows, Forget Tantra. In the Bodhisattva vows, you have a vow to even break an earlier vow, like kill or steal or lie, if it's for the benefit of a sentient being. Now, this is also like science fiction in our world, because we see if there's a bad person and they look bad, we assume with our narrow fundamentalist mind coming from delusions, they must be bad. So we believe in whatever we see. We believe if you see a person lie, they're bad. And we believe in what we see. Well, back in high school, in the, in the Hinayana level of teachings, we start to look into the mind and we start to see how delusions function and how they lie to us. And we see the entire universe through the lenses of our delusion. So we believe in whatever we see. We believe in everything we see. So if you're a really angry person and you've got lo lots of anger and lots of superstition and lots of jealousy, you're going to see the world as a nightmarish environment and you will never say, oh, I see that person as angry. I'm not sure if they're really angry. I'm not sure if they're bad. I just see it that way. Don't be ridiculous. We believe one billion percent in what we see. That's fundamentalism. That's ego grasping. That's the worst nightmarish delusion. It brings incredible suffering. So what we're trying to cut all these delusions. So the question to myself is, when I'm sitting in this situation, am I clairvoyant? The answer is no. Can I say with certainty that Geshe Kelsan Gyatso is not a Buddha? No. Conclusion, as I don't have the wisdom to judge that he is actually a Buddha or not, then I leave it there. And so what do I do as a result, Catherine? I haven't had teachings from him since. I, my heart isn't happy, but I've kept my mind clear. And what's the reason for that? I don't want to be, you know, I don't want to go onto all these terrible websites and get involved in these garbage and discussions and shouting and yelling and opinions. That's what we do in the West. We all go mad, all thinking we have to have an opinion. And we argue and become destructive and negative. It's like a nightmare. It's like hell. I don't want to do that. I've protected my mind. I don't want to close my eyes and put my head down in the ground. What do we say? You put your head, what do you say? You Like an ostrich. Thank you, that one. You just want to, not like that. I look at it, I learn from it, I accept it, and I leave it there. So what have I done? 
I mean, I see all the stuff. I've seen, I've heard all the stories lately, what's going on. I hear about it all. But I just leave it there. Why We have this obsession to have an opinion about everything. But, but I'm not qualified to have an opinion. It's like I'm hearing, you know, Stephanie having a scientific discussion with her colleagues and I'm shouting and yelling, giving an opinion. I'm not qualified. I haven't, I haven't studied physics. So shut your mouth. Well, I don't, have the, I don't have clairvoyance. I don't have the wisdom to see where he is coming from. So I leave it there. I just leave it there and don't have an opinion. So I protect my mind. I've created no negativity. I've never criticised his students. I've never criticised him. Who is the beneficiary of that is me. That's the answer. So I keep him in my merit field. I keep him there. I think he is my lama. Because the, the, and this is where Tantra comes in now. We love to hear about these things. Tantra, Bodhisattva path is bad enough. The Tantric path is outrageous. The Bodhisattva path, for example, a story. When you realise a person who could be a Bodhisattva, they can do heavy duty things because they're truly coming from compassion. I mean, we've got to understand that possibility. That's not cap we're not capable of that in our regular deluded way of seeing the world. So you've got to posit that possibility. So there's a story. When my mother met Lama Yeshi first, a year after I'd become a nun, I went home, and, and, and I was travelling with the two lamas in Australia, and I was raising money for Kopan Monastery for the monks. So my mother, wanting to make me happy, she decided she'd have a party, you know, to invite all her friends and charge $100 and offer the money. Well, I was so happy for her. But I wanted her to meet Lama Yeshi. So she came up to meet him, had an appointment with him. And my mum was very proud. She's a wonderful human being. She was a musician. She's dead now. She was a musician. She was very talented. She had seven, eight children. She, she managed the family company because my father was a bit hopeless. She was amazing. She worked so hard all her life taking care of her family. She was incredible. I admire and love my mother. So anyway, she was quite proud, though. She never talked about her own problems. People, all, people flocked to her to, to tell their problems. She was like that, you know. She was a, a classical singer and a pianist. And I remember we brought up all her students, half her, her, half her male students, I don't know why, they're all gay. So we always brought up with these gay men back in the 50s, you know. There was Brentley and Gregory and Ronnie, and Ronnie had this little car called Priscilla. He'd come and pick us up at school. We just knew lots of gay men. I don't know why, they all adored my mother. They just adored my mother, you know, these wonderful men. I adore them all. They're all good friends. Jock, Brentley, Gregory, Ronnie. No women, all the men. They're all devoted to my mum. She was their teacher. And she was like their guru. She, she solved their problems. She, they all came to her, but she never told her problems to other people. Well, there's Lama Yeshi. She's a powerful person, okay? But she had this meeting, and I, didn't, I wasn't there. But apparently Lama told me that she suddenly poured out her heart all about her, her, her daughter, Rabina. I mean, she had six daughters, but she had this particular relationship with me, and I was very, it was a very kind of dynamic you know, relationship. And she poured her heart out, which was completely unlike my mother. Because he's so powerful, he's very charismatic, he just opened her heart. But, she, but she, was, she came out of the meeting, I remember, and she was really angry. But also she, I knew she was touched deeply. And she told me, oh, he looked at the television while I was talking to him. So her pride was really offended, because he kept glancing at the television. She felt, so in other words, he, didn't, he showed as if he wasn't listening to her. So she was really upset. But he touched her heart deeply. So I was really worried. And then my friend Adele Hulse, who wrote Lama Yeshi's Big Love biography, she, we went to school together, the Catholic convent, Sacre Coeur, the Sacred Heart Nuns in Melbourne. We knew, we did, we knew each other at school. So anyway, she, she, she was my mum's friend. They'd drink sherry together and gossip about their mutual friends, you know. So my mum would always go on about, oh, that Yeshi, that Yeshi, she'd say, you know. She, didn't, she liked Zopa. Zopa seemed humble, but she couldn't handle Yeshi. So I think, oh, God, she's criticising a Buddha, you know, oh, God, what am I going to do here? Just, you know, and I'm worried about it. So then, anyway, I heard this wonderful story. You see, bodhisattvas, bodhisattvas in the time that, you know, they, they, they made this powerful long-term decision of bodhicitta. Bodhicitta is this outrageous. I mean, we've got to talk about it. It's insane level. It, it's the culmination of compassion. It's not a technically the, an equivalent of compassion. It's the result of an unbelievable compassion where you see the suffering of all beings is so unbearable to you, you know that you have to become a Buddha as quickly as possible, so then you're qualified to help them. So they're driven by this insane compassion. So they go from life after life after life, perfecting the six perfections until eventually they become a Buddha. So what drives them is this compassion. And they're not going to walk around looking like with a halo, okay? You can't tell a bodhisattva. And they're going to use, and this is, forget even Tantra, but even the, even the bodhisattva level, they're going to manifest in whatever way is useful for that sentient being. So the best methods to use are peaceful, to help sentient beings. And there's two different things the bodhisattvas have to do. They've got to benefit you right there according to your level. 
So if you need a cup of tea, they'll give you a cup of tea. But their long-term agenda is they need to hook you. They've got to make a karmic connection with you because everybody at this moment is not ready to be led to enlightenment. So they've got to get you in their entourage, if you like. They've got to hook you so that 47 lives later when you meet them again, they will recognise you because you've hooked them. They've got to hook people and they will do any damn thing it takes to hook people so they meet him in future lives. This is their long-term agenda. So this, he was in some village. This, this story I heard from about some story about this bodhisattva looking like a regular Joe. They're not going to look like a body. They're not going to look like a holy person. They can bodhisattvas can manifest as anybody. The homeless person down the road, your, your next door neighbour, your neurotic mother-in-law. This is where it's so shocking the view in bodhisattvas. Even the Tibetans have a saying: "You don't know who anybody is, so don't judge." This is outrageous. This forget even tantric views even more outrageous. You've got, this is why you can't leap into these teachings without having heard the teachings. You've got to know it's possible to subdue the delusions. You've got to know it's possible to have this level of compassion. And it's possible to manifest from life after life to benefit sentient beings in whatever way is necessary. So this particular village, he met everybody and he hooked everybody. And of course the best method is be peaceful, be nice, be cute, be sweet to people. Then they won't forget you. Because you see the Buddha's view is everything you see and hear and taste and touch and smell leaves a karmic imprint in your mind. It leaves a memory in your mind. It will not ever leave leave that's the cause of you meeting them again and recognizing them that's how come i found myself at chen raising institute when i was 31 and it was like i recognized it was like wow this is familiar that's why the the, the 19 year old white supremacist he read hitler it reminded him of what he knew already from before you bring it from before and you meet it again so this is the, they knowing all this and their job is to hook. So they, he hooked all these nice people. They thought he was a lovely fellow and so nice he was. But there was one old lady who didn't notice him and he couldn't leave her behind. He has to hook her. He has to get her. So when he meets her in 42 lives or seven lives, when she's ready to be led to enlightenment, she will see him and recognize him. So he didn't know what to do. So he discovered she had this beautiful garden. So then the next way you have to hook people, you've got to use wrathful methods for the, he for, the thick, for the thick ones, for the heavy-duty ignorant ones who couldn't be hooked by sweet methods. So he decides he rides his horse through her garden, destroying it. Now, if you were there at the time, you wouldn't say, oh, there's a bodhisattva hooking this lady. You'd be, who do you think you are? How dare you do this? And you'd drag him off to the police and sue him and put him in prison. Isn't it? So we don't know who anybody is. This is so humbling. This is such an outrageous uh, concept. But if you don't know the Bodhisattva teachings, you will not understand this possibility. So, my, I thought of my mum. My mother, Lama Yeshi, as far as I'm concerned, Lama Yeshi hooked her. If she'd, my mum had sat there in the usual way where she dominated the meeting, and I'm not being horrible, she was very kind, but she ran the show. So if she, my, my mother sat there and Lama just said, yes dear, no, no dear, three bags full dear, and still looked all humble and sweet, she wouldn't even remember Lama Yeshi. But he put a deep imprint in her mind. She will not forget Lama Yeshi. He got her. He hooked my mum. Just telling these stories. You don't know who anybody is, so don't judge. And you don't know that's possible until you understand the Bodhisattva teachings. And you don't know that's possible until you understand the Hinayana teaching, which is junior school and high school. Forget the tantric one. I mean, I've heard that these 84,000, 84,000, 84, Mahasiddhas, this famous group of amazing tantric yogis. And I don't know if this is true. I don't know if anybody studied the 84 Mahasiddhas. But, you know, you hear these stories of these outrageous dudes with these, and some, I don't know, I think they're all boys probably, look up these girl consorts, you know, and they're outrageous behaviour. I mean, they're outrageous behaviour. Who is it, Tilopa? I was confused. Who is Tilopa? Is, is Naropa's teacher or the other way around? I can't remember. Who's the one who ate fish? Who, who was a fisherman? <laughs> I can't remember. But, I mean, you, you'd see this wild dude killing fish. And then, you know, the, the disciple, Naropa, I think. I can't remember. Tilopa, Naropa, whichever one. I get confused. He, he was completely devoted. He, he kind of completely became devoted. But what you saw was this maniac killing fish. You have these outrageous stories in Tantra. And then you start to look at all this iconography. You know, we think, all oh, these cute pictures. Oh, there's Yaman Taka. Look at that wrathful Buddha. Oh, wow. 47 legs and 62 arms. And you know, with the wrathful teeth and hair standing up. We think, oh, isn't that lovely art? Well, I'm sorry, people. If you met Yaman Taka in human form, he would scare the shit out of you. You'd think you met a maniac. So Tantra is too outrageous. I mean, I always so think outrageous things, but 
I'm just talking, okay? So the fundamental thing that drives through all of this is the view that things don't have an inherent nature, that things are according to the level we have in our mind. As Lama, yes, as Lama Zopa says, everything in the world appears back to us in the aspect of what's in our mind. So if anger's in our mind, you're going to see garbage. I mean, look in America at the moment. The conspiracy theories. I mean, look, this is the mind of ignorance gone completely out of control. Talk about wrong views. Anyone will believe anything. We believe anything because ignorance is so outrageous. Not just in America, it's everywhere. But this QAnon business. People believing this thing of, you know, Trump is the boss of this group of people who are trying to conquer the pedophiles. And I mean, the stories. Because we will believe anything we see and we'll believe anything we hear. And which part of us causes that is the delusions. Anger, attachment, jealousy, paranoia, pride. We, we, I mean, we're all insane, you know. That all came from Catherine's question. This is heavy-duty stuff, so please go one step at a time, okay? But if you just leap into Tantra or even the Bodhisattva path, thinking, you know, and it could be the Buddha, or there's a man coming at me with a gun. It could be the Buddha. Oh, please shoot me. I mean, don't be stupid. We get so confused because we haven't gone stage by stage by stage in the practices. You've got to control your body and speech first and shut up and back off and zip your lip and keep your hands to yourself. Calm your mind down. And then you start to become your own therapist and learn about delusions and virtues. That's the secret to success. And then you get to the bodhisattva path and then you get to the tantric path. Okay, if you've got confidence in the path, you can do all these things, but you, look, you go at your own pace and you understand that things don't exist the way they appear. This is the central thing in the whole of Buddha's view of the universe, the view about emptiness. It's huge. It's, it, in, it underpins everything. It infuses everything in the path. Everything is driven by the view of emptiness. Even the view of karma is a first example of a first, it's a perfect example of the first level of dependent arising that everything has a, is a result of causes, which is the first logic to prove emptiness. Everything starts with that. The view is massive in Buddhism. So begin to get some sense of this. Begin to get some sense of how the mind works, what the delusions are. Beginning to get a sense of all this. This has got to go one step at a time. Build ourselves properly one step at a time. You know. Are we communicating, people? I think it's time we to had um, two more questions lined up, Venerable Rabina. We have a couple more minutes in this session. Okay. I don't know if you want to hold them over to next time. No, go, Gina. Good idea, darling. Okay. It's Wendy next? Yes, Wendy. Good, darling. This is probably my suspicious mind. Go on, never mind. But um, when, when things broke down at the center, they, you know, there was talk about the students having the karma for this incident. This is a particular but experience of yours. Been... Sorry, Wendy, is this a particular experience of yours at a particular center, is it? Or are you talking no, to me? No, it's the, my the, experience. The, the example that you gave. Oh, okay, good, good, good. Yes, go this, on. Good, good, go on. The, the students had karma. But isn't it also true that the gurus had the karma for this? Okay, this is the point, darling. This is the point, Wendy, when it comes to guru devotion. This is the essence of the point. My job as the disciple is to make a decision, is to look and check on the teacher and check on their qualities, and then when I decided I'd taken a tantric initiation from the Lama. This is crucial in Tantra. I have to have the confidence on my, based on my market research that he's valid. And then when I take the initiation, the entire, the essential practice in Tantra, and I want to go into this, is the view that he, that Lama, is the embodiment of the Buddha solely for my sake. So if he is the Buddha, he, karma's finished. Karma's finished. So my view, if he's not, listen, honey, if he's not my guru, first of all, seeing somebody as a Buddha doesn't mean they're the Buddha. That from their side, they might not be the Buddha. This is where the tricky part comes. But my practice is to have confidence that that manifestation is the Buddha's mind manifesting in that human body for my sake. That one single view is the essence of the view of guru devotion, seeing the guru as the Buddha and the Buddha as the guru, which is, we have to cultivate that. So I can never tell you that, I can't tell you the Dalai Lama is the Buddha. I am not clairvoyant, Wendy. 
I do not know if he is the Buddha. Now, anybody I respect says he is the Buddha, that's fine. But I can never know he is the Buddha until I am the Buddha. But what's my practice until then is not just live in doubt, because if I live in doubt, well, he could be the Buddha, but I'm not sure. Therefore, why should I trust his words? I will never get anywhere. So it's this tricky practice for my benefit that I practice seeing the Dalai Lama as the Buddha. And that view is what opens my mind wide to hear every instruction he gives. So I can then become the Buddha. So then, as far as my mind is, that Geshe Khasan Gyatso is the Buddha. For my mind, not everybody sees him that way. So if he is not a Buddha, then of course he's part of it. But that's not the view I have, because the Buddha is leading his students. My view is that, to keep my mind pure, it is the Buddha, due to the student's collective negative karma, he is guiding these particular students who have faith in him, so that's his action of compassion, and I leave it there. I can't understand it, I don't know, I don't need to understand it, I leave it there, and I protect my own mind. Okay? It's really logical, but we don't like it, because we want to believe what we think is true. No, I get it in the sense of I I believe that I have a deluded mind yeah. and that I can't I've, see the reality. I've seen an action, right? right. So I've exactly. seen myself interpreting things that are not. That's right. Full and forget the gurus. I mean, when your our entire life is this, we believe in yeah. every, a person's mean to us at work. We believe they're a horrible person. We don't factor in karma. We don't factor our own mind in. We just have this narrow, fundamentalist view of the universe. The more we understand the Buddha's view, the more shocked we should be at how deeply deluded we all are. Our view of the mind is so deluded. I also get scared of kind of cultish behavior. But where that's but who's cult? Wait a minute. Stop. Stop, Wendy. Whose cultish behavior? Yours or somebody else's? Mm, good question. Excuse me. That's um, right. You um, don't have to do anything. You're the boss in your bloody life. You decide. You be clear. I cultish just, behavior. Guess, Wendy, well, Wendy, Wendy, Wendy. Yes. Cultish behavior is the, the root delusion, ego grasping, being fanatic and narrow-minded and small and fixed. That's cultish behavior. Fundamentalism. These, I mean, the QAnons, everything you can come up, that's all cultish behaviour. That's cultish behaviour is narrow-mindedness and ignorance and stupidity. So, yeah, have, have fear of it, but your own. Yes, yes. Doesn't matter, doesn't matter else do what they like. You're not in charge I, of I them. Do, I see what you're saying. I, I think it, I'm having a hard time holding both these things in one thing, which is um, check it out. Check it out. Chew the gold, right? See if it's real. And then this idea of guru devotion, which is once I've made my decision, I've checked it out, then no longer do I have that um, faculty working in my mind. Which faculty? The one of checking the gold, the one of making sure it's real. What? Which one's real? What's real? Um, so like the Buddha says to, to trust the teeth, you know, don't trust my words, check it out. That's right. Do your Exactly. Do your why, why, am I, why are you suggesting I'm disagreeing with that? Where's your point? I don't understand. You're not, but word devotion for me somehow says what? at a certain point you are going to give over because you've done enough checking. But for me, checking out is a living action. But then, so what, I, okay, so then, okay, I hear what you're saying. But listen, when you've got, I mean, you're studying music, you have faith in your teacher. What's wrong with that? I had Mr. F Mr. Lee, my Kung Fu teacher, he was brilliant. I had faith in him. He shouted at me. I didn't feel insulted. I was honoured because he wanted. I knew he wanted me to have his Kung Fu. What's, what, that's devotion. What's wrong with that? People do that every day. You do it every day, you know. Where's your problem? Where's the problem? Who told... You're, you're being... Guess, no, you're very... But, but your very talking, points... Your very... Wendy, Wendy, your very points, yeah. you're being fundamentalist. You're assuming as soon as you've done this, then suddenly you all just let go and now it's all just faith and do what he likes. And yes. Just, yes. You're, being, you're, being, you're, being, you're being... You're being fundamentalist in your very way you're saying it. It's not like that. Yes. Is it no, it's incremental. No, I think I'm talking and, too theoretically and you I are, don't it's have not, It's exactly right, example. darling. It's not yeah. like that. And in the end, you do what you can. If your teacher says to you to do something and you can't do it, you simply feel, I can't do it, and you say, you say something. You be reasonable. You're an intelligent person. You be reasonable. Everything yes, is one yes. step at a time. Was, when, listen to me. Listen, Wendy. Question. Listen. Everything is at one step at a time. And whether your cooking teacher, your kung fu teacher, if my kung fu teacher says, I want you to do 50 push-ups, and I break my back doing it, then he wants me to push myself to the limit. And I'm honoured to push myself to the limit. But if I can't get to 50, I'm not going to kill myself. You do what you can with confidence. It's an organic, incremental 
interdependent process. The way you're even saying it is like so fundamentalist. It's just not like no, that. No, I think there's just fear. There's fear. But I hear you. Fear I hear of you, what, Rubina. Wendy? Please excuse me. Fear of what? Analyze it. Fear. What are you afraid of? What are you talking about? I don't. Tr I I tend to push myself, and I tend to um, devote too much in my from my past well, experience. Okay. Is right? it, okay. Now, uh, Wendy, is that delusion or virtue? You've got to know the difference between attachment and virtue. Have you know? Do you know Buddhist psychology enough yet? Have you studied it? I'm sure you have. So you have to know: is it is it attachment that's pushing you, or is it valid cognition that's pushing you? You have to know the difference. <laughs> I can tell you right now it's attachment. Well, then if um, you're attachment, don't follow it. You're a maniac. Yeah. That's not yeah. virtuous. That's not devotion. Don't conflate them. That's yes, a yes. I like that's the differentiation. Well, that's what you do, and you learn that in high school, honey. Forget the bodhisattva path. Forget the tantric path. One, that's why you've got to go one step at a time. This is real serious knowledge we're talking. It's like math. You can't literally understand it until you've gone through the stages. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Good. What's the other question? Gina, darling. Um, we had a question from Lynn, but she said um, it can wait till What's a later session. It's up to you. What's the question? Lynn? You can unmute, please. Lynn, un oh, there you go. Where she is. What's the question, I'm darling? I'm here. Well, I think I know the answer. <laughs> but basically, I think, well, wow, it feels like valid teachers from the tibetan tradition are thin on the ground now um, I don't know, not too many opinions please lynn just ask a question yeah, that's what I mean. so mainly do i have to personally connect with a guru in order for him to be my or my guru what do you Meaning, mean by that? i don't understand you. what's the option back. pardon what's the option to not connect what's the option to connecting uh researching investigating checking out the person and if they're if they're visible like his holiness it's not a problem for me to see oh guru. So, what, so what's the question but i'll never sit down with him and be guided by him personally no, okay that's that gets us to what the practice is and that has to come later this is where okay. you, you know your, your, your guru can be dead lama yes he's dead okay he's still uh -huh. my guru in the present and that's where we come to the real practice which is where we're going to talk about tara the real heart of the practice of the growth of that devotion and the growth of the qualities has in a sense got nothing to do with that person outside there in the human body that goes on in your practice that happens in your mind it's a personal thing when we think of devotion we think of two people having a relationship it's not like that you're using that we're going to talk about this afterwards we're going to talk about it afterwards it's really the crucial one okay thank you Thanks. Let me have a break now have a nice break two hours and uh do whatever you're going to do thank you Rubina. yeah and i'll see you all soon darlings Thank you, precious ones. Thank you, Venerable Rubina. Goodbye, darling. We have a two-hour break, everyone. We start back up at uh, 